Uh, we're talking today with Bruce Whipple of Lansing, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Bruce, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in April 49, right here in Lansing. Okay. Went to school in Lansing. Um, I spent a little time in my early years um, in Holt. We lived in Holt for a while. And then we moved to Lansing. I went through all the Lansing schools. My mother was a assistant to the principal at Dwight Rich. So I got to know most of the teachers and could get away with a few little things. And that was always, you know, she was always quite behind me with everything I did. I mean, she was always, you know, pushing me to do better and know people and that. So, but I graduated from Everett High School we, um, in 67. Um, I'd gotten my draft notice just prior to that, went down for my first physical. Um, in February of 69 um, was when I had my actual draft induction notice. And at that time, went out to uh, the Red Cross Center and took a bus at 5.30 in the morning down to Detroit and went through the induction process. Okay. Now, at this point, uh, how much did you know about what was going on in Vietnam and all of that? Um, absolutely nothing. Um, when in high school, I was into cars and girls and just having a good time and partying. Um, never paid any attention to the newspaper, the television, or anything like that. We were just out to have a good time. Mm -hmm. and did um, you know anybody who had been drafted or gone off to Vietnam already? Um, I had because the, the well, I was working at at a auto trim, Schubel's Auto Trim, and the my neighbor across the street, his brother had just been drafted and inducted, and he asked me to come down and help him out at the shop. And of course, doing that, I I had no idea. I was still in the high school, mm -hmm. um, so I went to went down there and talked to Jack, and and this was on a Friday and. And told him, you know, I came down to help out if I could, and and uh, Ken's brother was being drafted, and I was going to take his place. And um, Jack says, "Okay," and handed me a key to the door and said, uh, "Come in Saturday and open up for me." And I'm thinking, I don't know anything about this. And he said, "Oh, just answer the phone, tell him I'll be in when I get in." He said, "You know, sweep the floors and take care of things," and that's how it all started. And mm -hmm. I've been there over 40 years now. That was in 65 that I started. And Ken's brother came back and, and I had a, a real good friend of mine that I grew up with, Dale Hildebrandt. He had uh, joined the Navy and he was just getting out of the Navy. Uh, he was actually in the reserves. but um, So he needed a job so I said, you know, come down and work with me. So there was the three of us that were Jack and, and Doc and I. that. Uh, okay, so when you finished high school, you didn't have any plans for college at that point or anything like that? No, I had this job that I loved doing. Mm -hmm. I loved working with cars. I loved, I mean, it was just such a natural. I mean, I couldn't believe that I could do this and they paid me for mm -hmm. it. I could make money doing this and I just loved doing it. Working on hot rods and custom cars and um, doing all the, you know, meeting all the big guys from the, the custom, you know, Carl Casper and Ed, Big Daddy Roth, I mean, all these guys that, you know, they're California people that all these big names you see on TV and, you know, I can do this and enjoy it and, you know, I don't even have to work the weekends if I don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. so. But they don't give draft deferments for that, so. No, they didn't. All right. You know, so you at, get, yeah. At the time when I first got my first induction notice, uh, my girlfriend worked down at, on uh, May Street at the, the draft board down there, mm -hmm. and that's where you went to, to uh, sign up, mm -hmm. you know, to get you all your papers and that. And uh, I asked, she said, well, I'll just put your card back. I mean, you didn't, it wasn't a number or lottery thing, but just your name on a card. He said, I'll put your card back. And, well, that lasted about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I ended up getting my my notice to go, mm -hmm. and it was your friend that worked at the 
up north at the Gratiot, we could go in for seven years rather than one year. Oh, at, um, the guys that I went to school with, Bob Taylor, his father was big in the National Guard. And so at the time, towards the end of, we're talking about graduating, and mm -hmm. now we're hearing, you know, we've all got our draft notices and we got our cards, we're all 1A, and, you know, we're just waiting for our induction mm -hmm. papers. And um, Bob was trying to get everybody to join the National Guard. And just down the street from my house, two blocks, you know, and I'm thinking about it. And we, we were all thinking pretty seriously about it. And I think out of the five of us as a, that ran around as a group, um, of course, Bob enlisted in the garden, and his dad was was already, you know, a commander there. And I think one or two of the other guys um, joined the garden. Well, I'm thinking, you know, if I join the guards, that's six years, and if I get drafted, that's two years. Um, in high school, I was taking up architecture and and engineering and drafting and that sort of thing. I thought maybe they could use somebody like that. I did auto upholstery. I thought well, they definitely going to need people to patch tents and fix jeep tops and mm -hmm. seats. And then I thought, you know, I could take a chance and I could do two years standing on my head. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I thought. Right. I'm thinking six years, two years. I can do two years of standing on my head. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now you you go down. Uh, you get the physical and so forth. Uh, now, where do they send you then for basic training? We went down to, to Fort Wayne in Detroit. That's the induction center. Mm -hmm. We were all processed through, you know, just naked guys in the line getting shots and, you know, you're all fine. I mean, you could they couldn't find anything wrong with anybody, I don't think. Um, At that point, were there any people trying to, to find ways to, to, to beat the physical? Oh, everybody or? was trying to beat the system. Yeah, everybody. I mean, well, I got one leg that's shorter than the other, you know, and uh, it didn't make any difference. Well, I can only see one out of the one. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Um, we ended up going through that process, and then they put you in a room where they have you, you know, raise your right hand, and they swear you in as, as being, you know, enlisted in the service, and they have you count off. You know, one, two, three. They have you all, everybody in line. One, two, everybody count off. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then they said, you know, everybody that's number three step forward. And they said, congratulations, you're Marines. So you know, they talk about, you know, the Marines never drafted. Well, yes, they did. I was lucky to be a two with that day, thinking that, you know, all these guys. I didn't want to be a Marine. They they were really, you know, in the in the deep stuff, you know. So then we left, we left there and got on a, a, a prop plane in Detroit at the airport, Will Run. And first time I'd ever flown in a plane. Never been in a plane, never been even near one. And we get in this prop plane and one of the kids, the guys that I went to school with, uh, uh, Craig Redman, we rode the bus down to Detroit together and talked. We sat together on the plane. I mean, he was like my, you know, even my big brother at that time, I mean, he was the one I, you know, held me together. The first time flying in the plane, I'm a nervous wreck, I'm drafted, I'm going, you know, I'm just totally wiped out. We fly down to North Carolina because the normally people from Michigan would go to uh, Fort Knox or Fort Campbell, right. you know, someplace like that. Well, they were full. So we ended up in Fort Bragg down in North Carolina. Nothing but sand and pine trees. And I'm thinking, I'm kind of used to this, you know, being a Michigan guy, going up north, being at the beach, you know, and sand and pine trees. And man, was that a workout? Sand and pine trees. And to this day, I, my wife says, you know, well, let's go to the beach, and the family's going to the beach. I says, well, once I get all that sand cleared off the beach, I'll be happy to go there. But I do not like sand. It's just what a, was the basic training experience like down there? Oh. I was a little guy. I was. I only weighed like you know. I was about five, five eleven. Weighed one hundred and ten pounds, and um, it was it was scary. I mean, and I was the small guy, and you know you got to do all these big guy things that, and you know something you're not really used to. Um, what was the big guy thing? Well, the big guy thing being um, being able to do all these ladder bars and all these push-ups and you know I wasn't conditioned for that. I did grow up out in Holt so 
um, on a farm. So I was used to, you know, farming and, and hunting and fishing and being in the woods. I mean, as a kid, we'd go out and spear frogs and then fry, fry out frog legs or, you know, catch some, you know, swim in the river and catch fish or, or go ice skating down the river. You know, as a young kid, that's what I did. Um, I was good with a rifle. I mean, I was, when we'd go out with the bows and arrows and slingshots and they would have, everybody had their own 22 rifle and, you know, that's what you did. Well, that was my big downfall. I'm thinking, I'm not going back on my experience as a kid. I'm going on my experiences, you know, going through school and the job I had, you know, that would keep me out of being in the infantry. Well, needless to say, my youth came into play and I was good on the rifle range. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in an infantry unit okay. training. Now, and when you were doing the, the physical training parts, was, was there stuff that you, they were telling you to do that you couldn't do the first time? Or Oh, definitely, yeah. And yeah. what happens to you at that point? You just try to do more. I mean, um, you're, you're, in, you're in this barracks with you know, this huge building and there's two floors and you got, you know, somebody's got to be up at night watching the, make sure a fire doesn't break out and, and you go out at, you know, you get up at five o'clock in the morning and go out and do calisthenics and then you run to a class and you run to that class and then you come back for lunch and do calisthenics before, you have to do calisthenics and ladder bars before you can even get in the, in the mess hall and then you eat and then you run to wherever you're going to, your next class and that and then you're out on the rifle range or some other range, you know, practicing or you're doing bungee sticks where you're battling one another and um, then you come back to the to the barracks and you got to clean, you got to scrub the floors, you got to scrub the latrines, um, everything's got to be spotless, you got to polish your boots and then, you know, when lights go out, then you have to write your letters home. I mean, they still want you to, you know, put something in the mailbox. You know, you just, there's not enough time. There's just not enough time. There's just, uh, you're running, you're running this ragged. How much emphasis did they have on military discipline? Oh, everything was military discipline. You didn't talk to, you had to go through your little chain of command, even from the, you know, you had to go to your, your squad leader who went through your platoon leader that, you know, you couldn't just voice something you know, unless you were asked, you didn't speak to anybody, you know, higher than that. You know, you spoke to them first. Um, the squad of, of five to seven guys, um, you were, you know, you were, your squad leader was the one that you went to, but your squad, you had to, everybody had to hold everybody together. Because if one guy doesn't do well, then the next guy, you know, didn't do well. And the whole squad then falls, and then that puts you on another list. That then you're doing KP, and you know you're out picking up cigarette butts. I mean, um, just everything, every nasty little thing you can think of. Um, they got you doing. Uh, you're sneak. You're trying to sneak food in because you're hungry and you want something. And you know, I got caught sneaking in a can of Coke into the barracks and had to do push-ups for it. Had to, you know, they, then they tried to take the can away from me and. At that point, I'm so annoyed that you know I've done all these push-ups and I want this can of Coke. That you know, grabbed it out of his hand and started drinking it, and of course that made things even worse. So that put me on KP for a while, and a little few more push-ups every time, you know. And at that point, I learned that you know just be the little quiet guy in the corner, you know, keep your mouth shut, you know, just follow the guy in front of you and don't let you know don't look around. And that was, that was what they wanted, that was what they wanted to do, that, you know, you, you follow the guy in front of you and you do what he does and whoever's in front of him tells him what he's going to do and, you know, the, the biggest thing, everything, everything was kill this and kill that, you know, everything you did was, you know, the screaming and hollering and kill. And that just worked you into that, that, that form, mm -hmm. the form that they wanted you to be. I mean, at 19 you're so, you're, you're taking in everything you can. And you're so, what do I want to, you're so, uh, 
or impressionable, I guess. Yeah, you're so impressionable that 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 just you know you just eat that up as far as you know, and then they're going to tell you how big a man you're going to be, and you know how you're going to you're invincible, and you know and that just sticks with you. And, and these guys that are training us, the guys that are running us through all this, are Vietnam vets that have just come back. So when you have your breaks and you're sitting around, you're just having a little BS session. You know, these guys are in the middle, and I mean, your eyes are this big around, just glued on them, you know. Were they trying to give you some idea of what oh, to expect? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they said, you know, what you learn here is nothing. You'll end up not using what you learn here, but you want to remember what you learn here because by being that group is, is safety. I mean, if, if, if one guy does something and you know that's what he's going to do, then that covers you. Because if he's going to do this and you, you know, he goes right, you would go left, you know, that's the way it's going to be. You had to have this, this line of, of uh, this guy, you know, first guy, second guy, third guy. That's, everybody does what, they're, what they do and you follow what they're, what they're doing. So they're trying to prepare you to learn the stuff that you'll really need. Uh, what when, they're when really you preparing it. you for, it, they're preparing you for the fact that, you know, things are going to die, people are going to die, it's going to be, you know, a lot uh, going on, but they're preparing you just to be tough. I mean, because everything's about fight and kill, and even the guys, when you get in with the, the punji sticks and that, and you're fighting, you know, you're, you're out there to kill that guy, you're, to do him harm. I mean, you... And he may be your friend, you know, he may be your friend, but if he can't take it, or you can't take it, somebody's going to die. That's what they put in your head. You've got to be physically fit. And the road guards that they had, when you rode, ran down the company street, you ran every place you went. Nobody walked, you ran. And you ran down the company street, and at the cross, at the, 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 where the street crosses, you had to have a road guard that he'd run out and block up one on each side of the road to block any vehicles or any traffic and so that you guys could run through. Well, they took the real big guys, you know, the guys that were overweight, they were the crossing guards. So they had on these vests, you know, lit up, you know, reflective. Mm -hmm. But they'd have to run up to the street and block it. Well, then you'd run through. Well, they had to run up to the front again and catch everybody up so you could get at the next street. There wasn't the next guy in line that did that. Those guys were, that was their, their whole thing. And that was how they got them in shape. And these guys, I mean, I had a guy that, uh, Zadibba was his name, I can't remember his first name. He was our crossing guard. And I mean, he was a big guy. And he got into fantastic shape. 20 years later, I'm out mowing the yard at home and He's moving in the house across the street. And I looked at him, and I thought, like, God, I know that guy. I looked at him, and I like, you know, it came to me, and, you know, and just, here, you, here we are, neighbors, you know, 30, 20 years later, I think it was at that time. Right. Now, were most of the men who were training along with you, were they mostly from Michigan and the Midwest, or were they from no. a lot of places? No, that was my biggest downfall as far as, you know, getting to reunions and that kind of thing. Um, by being in North Carolina, there was only one platoon of us that were from Michigan. Everybody else was from Tennessee or Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. So that was all their area. So then when you went on with your service, you were still, everybody was still in that same block. Mm -hmm. So when we got done at Fort Bragg for basic, we went up to Fort Dix in New Jersey for AIT, um, which they called advanced individual training, but it's advanced infantry training. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all Dix was. And so I'm still with all these guys from down south. So, and I don't like sweet tea and banjo music. And, you know, and I wasn't a country fan, country <laughs> music fan. So, but here I am in the middle of all these guys. And, you know. What kind of backgrounds did they have? Did you learn much about them? I mean, Oh yeah, I mean, um, the guys from North Carolina, um, uh, Bennett, Lyman Bennett, he saved my, my behind. Um, he w worked in a furniture factory. They had huge furniture factories that take up, you know, three or four or five blocks 
uh, in this building, and they just they build all this furniture. And he worked in the furniture factory. A lot of them, a lot of them were just there because there was just nothing else for them to do. You know, we had uh, guys that you know just got bumped out of school, and you know the judge gave them their choice. You know, you can you can uh, do thirty days or three months or whatever, or join the military. You know. And, did you have any guys who were a little bit older who maybe been in college for a while and then out or that we had a get well we had pops in, in Vietnam and um, John Hedrick is his name but yeah um, most of the guys that I was with in basic and that we were pretty much we were pretty much all the same age um, not too many college graduates down in the south I think mm -hmm. maybe that was it just because it, we were in the south but most of them we were we were about the same age um, not, I can't think of anybody that was actually a college graduate. Yeah, or there were a lot of guys that I ran into who had maybe done a year or two of college and then left for one reason or another, or their grades get bad and then they wind up there. So, right. But it, in the South, even among the white population, not that many were necessarily going to college at that point. So right. that wouldn't happen. Yeah. What proportion of them were minorities, do you think? Um, I would say all the one or two of our drill sergeants were were black, mm -hmm. um, and I would. I guess I'd have to go through and take out a picture. At that time, I was just basically a farm kid that moved to Lansing. Race had, I had no perception of race. I mean, one of my friends, Terry, uh, uh, in school, Terry, uh, just a. a I don't know. A few years ago, we got back together for a, a class reunion, and you know, he's telling me he's black, and I'm thinking, "Now wait a minute. Well, you know, well, you're my best friend in school, and and you know, I, you're not. You know, well, he was mixed race, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, he was. Well, you know, and he always said all the kids gave him a hard time at school. I said, Terry, you, you know, I don't ever remember any of that. I don't remember you know F's being, you know, that way, but." But yeah, I would say in the in basic, probably a third were were colored. Um, made no difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, they ran right along beside you. They crawled in the mud right along beside you. They they puked after coming out of the uh, out of the gas chamber, you know, with you. Uh, and I'd like to say our drill sergeant. I think all but one of them or two of them were were colored and. Um, they were the nicest guys in the world. I mean, they were hard on us, but they, we knew why they were hard on us. They were, they were trying to prepare us what they'd already been through, and they, you know, they did a heck of a job. Now, how was Fort Dix different from Fort Bragg in terms of the training you got and the experience you had? Fort, Fort Dix was more party. Fort Bragg was by the book, straight up letter. Fort, Fort Dix, um, we flew home every weekend. And I mean, we'd only have like a 50 mile pass, and we'd fly back to Michigan. And there was five of us that we flew back and forth to Michigan every weekend. How could you afford to fly back to Michigan? The ticket was uh, $16.50. It was $32, $33 going back because we, coming to Michigan, we'd fly standby. So we'd go military standby, $16.50. Coming back, we'd fly a regular. Regular tickets. Regular tickets. You had yeah. to be sure to get back on time. To, uh, yeah, we had to be back on time. So we were got stuck in the air one time in a in a snow storm, and um, we didn't. We got back late, but uh, anybody that didn't go any, I mean, if nobody stayed on base. I mean, as far as on the weekend, and, and if they did, all they did was drink. I mean, you'd come back on Sunday night, and you know, there's it's like being in a, a kind of a park atmosphere. They got picnic tables and benches and they're just littered with beer cans and you know that kind of thing and right. everybody at that point you know everybody knew where they were going okay because that you know when you go to advanced infantry training you're definitely you know low man on the totem pole at that point. All right. I Two of my friends from basic one guy Don Wilhelm slept above me and, and um, um, Steve Woodard slept in the next, next bunk next roll bunks and uh, Don was always upset he he lived in Petoskey 
Um, he was a ski instructor in the winter. His dad had a, a housing construction company that that there, so he worked in the summertime and building homes and had a mate. I lived in Petoskey, it's beautiful. Um, ski instructor in the winter, you know, how much better could you have it? He was all upset about going and uh, probably when we got our orders to go, Steve and Don both got orders to be engineers and go to Alaska. So I was pleased because then I hear Don, you know, um, he, that's what, you know, what he needed. You know, right. that, somebody's looking out for him, my, my, my feeling. So once in a while the Army does something intelligent. Yeah, and the bad part is um, it doesn't necessarily work in your favor. Um, I got back and probably, I was at a car show, of course working back at the trim shop after coming back, probably about five years later, I was at a car show and uh, ran into Steve Woodard and he was at the car show. And we were talking and they hadn't seen each other. He says, you heard what happened to Don, didn't you? Yeah. No, never. Steve was this, the first time I'd ever seen him or didn't, you know, wouldn't know Don or see him because of him being at Petoskey. And he said, well, he came home on leave to get his car. He just bought a new El Camino and was driving it back up to Alaska and um, was hit by a train wow. and killed. So I still have the three of us, uh, we have pictures of from outside the barracks. And I still have that picture that I always set out and always think about that. And All right. What did the training at, at Dix actually consist of? What were you doing there? Well, Dix, actually, I was trained more into mortars. So um, our, most of our time was, again, physical, running here to there. Um, learning to shoot the mortar, um, going to classes to shoot, you know, mortar, um, learning to shoot the 60 machine gun, um, your rifle, you know, qualifying with your rifle. Um, we didn't get to throw grenades, we threw rocks, because the, the group that went through in front of us, the group that went through in front of us had somebody dropped a grenade in the pit and the guy was killed, they have a sergeant in there with you and he's teaching you, you know, how to throw the grenade and, and, uh, cause you're not just supposed to, you know, throw it like you'd normally throw something, you're supposed to, you know, do this special movement and everything. And one went off and killed the trainee and, and the sergeant was badly wounded and so at that point they wouldn't let you throw grenades anymore. So we threw rocks at the, you know, out of the pit and, you know, see how close you could get to whatever it was you're throwing the rock at. <laughs> Did you get to go into New York City at all, or? Um, no, we went into Philly. We missed our flight once, and we went into Philly. Um, not a good part of Philly. I mean, around an airport, you figure it's you know pretty much, but you can't believe the you know the row houses. There's you know house on house on house, and there you know there's street sidewalk house, and nothing in between them, and nothing what I'm used to. I'm I'm, I'm you know. I'm figuring I'm a city boy, but the houses that here in Lansing, there, you know, you got room between them that you can move, and you got a little greenery, you know. You know, there it was pretty, and it was a pretty rough place there. But we spent most of the time going from bar to bar, and uh, being in uniform. Uh, we had to be in uniform to fly standby, military standby. Um, the, the bartenders, are, as long as we were paying, they they give us beer. Yeah, this is 1969. I mean, you're. Did you ever get hassled by anybody because you were in uniform, or was that? Um. No, because we were weren't really out in the open. I mean, um, the people in the bars. Mm -hmm. It was dark, and they didn't. I don't think we. Were, I don't think we went to the bars actually dressed in uniform. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if we. I think we had all had a ditty bag, and we had shirts and pants in there. We had to go through the, well, after they got to know you, you didn't really have to get to be in uniform. But, uh, we always, it was a race, there was five of us that were always right from Michigan, you know, and so we'd get in a cab right outside the base and tell the cabbie, here's an, there's an extra $100 in it for you if you can get us to the airport on time, because mm -hmm. we just had minutes from the time we got out until, you know, 5 o'clock on Friday and mm -hmm. the flight left. 
and we flew Allegheny Airlines most of the time, and we'd run past the counter and the you know toss the, our stuff to the ladies, and they'd have everything waiting there for us at the <laughs> counter because they, they got to know us. I mean, you know, eight weeks of doing this, and we'd get up, run for the plane. They said, "Hurry up, because they're getting ready to pull the you know the boarding ramp." Mm -hmm. you know? We'd run to the gate and get on, and there was only like three or four stewardesses on the plane and us. Mm -hmm. So we just, the whole way back to Detroit, we'd drink and, and you know, talk to the stewardesses. There was nobody else on the plane. All right. Now, was AIT kind of your, your last stage of training before Vietnam, or? Right. Okay. Yeah. So at the end of AIT, do you get to go home first? You got 30-day leave. Towards the end, you know, they run you, they have a, a what they call a mock Vietnam village. And so you, they run you through that, and you kind of do a little war game in that. That's, that's your highlight of the, your training at Fort Dix. There. And then, yeah, you, we went home. We graduated from that, um, flew home, had a 30-day leave. And then my orders had me, you know, I had to, on this particular date, go to uh, Fort Lewis in Washington. And, and uh, I was on my way. All right. Uh, now, at, at this point, are you just going in as a replacement, so you don't know what unit you'll go to or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, you have no idea. You're just a, you're just a guy in an Army uniform, and you know, they give you, even when you process, um, you like went to the airport, got on the plane, and flew out to, to Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and we spent the night in a hotel again. There was the, the five of us. Mm -hmm. We ended up going to a hotel for the night, and then the following morning we had to report at like six o'clock in the morning and at the Fort Lewis. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they process your paperwork and make sure your your inoculations are all up to date and um, give you. I, I don't think they give you any fatigues. Uh, I think you're still in your dress greens mm -hmm. when you when you get there. Okay. Now, how long did you spend at Fort Lewis? Did they get you out right away, or did you stay around a few days? Oh, we were gone that night. Okay. Yeah, we were out at the airport late in the night, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning, and we were you know, twenty-two hour flight. There. Where did it stop? Or did it stop? It did. It stopped at. Uh, I I I don't honestly know exactly which ones we stopped at. Um, most of the flight I slept. When I got on a plane I just kind of fell asleep most of the time. Um, I know we stopped at Clark Air Force Base and we stopped in in Hawaii I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that the, the, the only thing I remember is coming into Cameron Bay. Okay. Were you on a military aircraft or a commercial one? It was a commercial aircraft. Okay. The stewardesses were all about 60 years old because by going into a combat area, it was a high priority, high pay flight. Mm -hmm. So here you are, 19 year old, and you got all these 40 or 50 year old stewardesses. <laughs> You're kind of bummed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, now, Probably the last woman you think you're ever going to see, because here you are going to a war zone, and mm -hmm. you think I'm never going to see another woman the rest of my. And I got to watch. I got to spend 22 hours on a plane with a, my grandmother. <laughs> that was the feeling. All right. Uh, now, what time of day do you remember? Was it when you got into Vietnam? Did you land during the day or at night? Uh, we landed in, during the day. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. It was in the morning, I would guess around 10. What was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there? Oh, it stunk. It was hot and it stunk. The humidity, I mean, it. they opened the door to this plane and it just hits you right in the face and likes to pull you right over. The heat, unbelievable, humidity, and it, again, nothing but sand. Cameron Bay, all you see is these huge sand dunes, and just um, every place you look is all just sand, nothing green. And you walk, step out of that plane and that smell hits you, and that place just reeked. I mean, it was the nastiest smell. It was like walking through a garbage dump. Mm -hmm. That's what it smelled like. Uh, now, what time of year was it? Now, is this about June or July? Or this is in this is in July. Okay, July twelfth. All right, uh, get in. Uh, what do they do with you once you get off the plane? Um, 
basically they ran you through um, a place to get kind of like a big, oh, they call it a pole building nowadays, a big pole building, steel roof building, mm -hmm. um, and they give you clothes. You get, you know, jungle fatigues. You got to get out of your, your, uh, your dress greens, mm -hmm. which were, you know, that was half the reason why you were sweating. And so they, you, they gave you a duffel bag and you, you know, clothes, underwear and socks and, you know, stuff. So, um, had you take, you know, go through the line and get that, and then had you go someplace and, you know, wherever you wanted to go, and they barracks or they didn't really have barracks, but they had like big latrine washroom kind of things and you go change and put your other stuff back in the duffel bag and you know it was just gone at that point. Mm -hmm. And how long did you spend there? Um, we were by that that evening I would say four or five o'clock in the afternoon we were on a bus out of there headed for uh, food no we went to Ben uh, and we went to Ben Wild. Okay. And that was, you got on this bus, I mean, first thing, you you know, you're all of a sudden you're dressed as a soldier, you know, mm -hmm. you're not looking spiffy, uh, and you're thinking, they gave us all this stuff, they didn't give us any weapons, you know, this is, you're, what's going on, I, all I've heard about is how bad this is, and you know, we're in a war, and you know, and they put you on this bus, and it's got steel wire mesh over the, chicken wire over the windows, and Wondering, you know, and of course, they're the, all the, everybody starts talking, and they, all the rumors you hear that, you know, well, that's so somebody doesn't run up and throw a grenade or something in the window and whatever. And, okay, well, you're taking this bus, and we ended up going to Benoit, and that was starting to, it was outside, the, it was a big base camp, and there was a villages all around it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a town outside of town, and they had like these wooden hooches that were raised up off the ground a little ways and there'd be about three laps of board and then the rest of it was screen with a metal roof and they had these big old army tents uh, the GP mediums and whatever the larges or whatever I guess you know they got the same size as underwear I don't know but it was like being in your underwear there because you're inside that and the temperature's hot and those tents don't breathe they're just that we spent the night in there and again no weapons uh, this whole plane load of guys inside these tents, all this stuff going on around you and things. And uh, that night, the ammo dump got hit. They bombed or mortared the ammo dump, and that went up. You know. So, uh, you know, and you don't have nothing. I mean, you're running around, you know, everybody's. You know. <laughs> what did you guys do? I mean, the thing just starts to... to you to, just sat there and shook. I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, you, you pucker up real good on that and everything gets real tight. <laughs> no, nobody sends you to a bunker or anything like that? You well, just, no, there's uh, no bunk. I mean, you're in a, a compound, but right. I mean, there's, the bunkers are way out beyond where you can see mm -hmm. from where you're at. And uh, you're in this tent all night long, you know, bugs, mosquitoes, the heat. It was just nasty. You know, you know, everybody hot and sweaty, and it was just you couldn't hardly get a breath. I mean, it was so heavy. The air was so heavy. And then the next morning came, and they started lining us up, and you know, saying, you know, you're you're gonna go, you know, where you're gonna go, and who you're gonna, and you're they checking your paperwork again, and filling out all your paperwork, and you're gonna be assigned to, you know, um, Greg ended up being assigned to the. The first cab, and he was the one that I went buddied up with. We were both from Lansing. Uh, our wives knew each other. Um, our family, you know, we knew you know, from 30 days of leave time, we spent a lot of time picnicking and cook off to his house and his parents' house and my parents' house. And um, so we got to know each other, and he, we got split up at that point. And he went with the with the first cab, and I ended up with the 101st. All right. So then it was a matter of, you know, you have your group, you know, you guys are going to the 101st, you know, wait for this, wait here and the truck will come get you and they put you on a plane and they put you on a cargo plane and we ended up going up to Camp Evans, which was up at my Fubai. And that was our major base camp for us. And we got there and everybody, 
people were there. There was a, a clerk, five or six of them, and they were calling out names. You go with this company, you go with this way. And so I ended up by myself going with the uh, Echo Company, the uh, second of 506. So that's how I got to that company. Then I got in there and they, um, into the company area, and then I started getting all my equipment. They started loading me down with all my equipment, rucksack, and finally got a weapon, and you know, what do you want to carry, you know? My stupid behind, I picked a thump gun, an M79 grenade launcher. I thought, wow, that'd be really neat. I, I was trained in mortars. I was one of the best that went through the class. And I'm thinking, thump gun, mortars, you know, things looping out of the tube. Yeah, I got it made, you know, the, this is it, you know. Did you get assigned to a mortar unit, or were you just... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I said Echo Company was uh, mortars and recon and uh, crew served equipment, uh, lightweight, light crew served thing, meaning it took more than one person. Mm -hmm. Like with a machine gun, you had a, your gunner and you had your ammo bearer, you know, so it was kind of a, right. that kind of thing. Um, normally, when I got got to Camp Evans, that I got assigned to, to Echo Company, and they loaded me up all my gear and stuff, said, go off the chopper pad, they're going to take some mail out to the, to the fire base. And it was a fire base called Birch's Garden in the Ashaw Valley. Well, it's the worst place you want to be. Yeah, you know, on a fire base in the Ashaw. The only thing worse than that is walking through the Ashaw Valley. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no difference. So go off the helicopter pad, wait for the helicopter, go out with the mail. And so I'm sitting out there, and I, some guy that, one of the guys that was out there had come in for medical reasons or something and or came in to get something I don't know I don't remember we sat and talked quite a bit and he's telling me about you know oh you'll be sweet you'll, you'll love it out there you know so you, you I want to introduce you to Susie when we get out there and I'm thinking Susie there's a female you know on the, on the chopper or on the, on the fire base and he's always telling me about Susie always telling me about Susie and uh, finally we sat there like three days every you know, until dark, and then we go back to the hooch and spend the night, and then we come back out and sit on the chopper pad. Now, this is steel planking you're sitting on. It's called, you know, PSP, perforated steel planking. It's got holes in it. It's a revetment for the helicopters land on so that they don't blow stuff around dirt and that. You're sitting on that at 107 degrees. There's no shade. So you're just sitting waiting for a helicopter? Just to sitting take there you waiting for a helicopter and sweating, getting used to the atmosphere and sweating and a little more use of the atmosphere and sweating, <laughs> trying to find something to drink, and you know. Did you get sunburn sitting out there? Oh yeah, you, yeah, you get sunburn. You get dark, and then you just stay dark after mm -hmm. that. But yeah, and you're just trying to find. You know, finally, we got a helicopter to go out. This is the first time I've ever flown a helicopter. Now I'm thinking, hop in the helicopter. They close the doors. No big deal. We go up. Nah, that doesn't happen either. The stuff goes in, and then you go in, and you're sitting on the edge of the helicopter with your feet hanging out. So this is a Huey or a smaller helicopter? The Huey. It's not a big Chinook or something. It's not like a that. Chinook. No. Yeah. This is a Huey. Most of the time we flew in, in Hueys. But you're sitting there, and you know, just hanging out. And you got your rucksack on, and you think, you know, when the tip, you know, you think you'd fall out. You know, it's really a, a weird feeling, but you're just sinking down, and you're hanging on, you know, you're... Knuckles are turning white, you know. You're grabbing, hanging on to anything, and the, you know, the door gunner is just getting a kick out of it because you know you got a newbie. We got a cherry here. Everybody was called cherries when they first came in country, and uh, you're scared. Yes, I mean just unbelievable. And you're flying along, and you know treetop level, and you know you got nothing, nothing out there but tops of trees and jungle. Flying along and up all these mountains. I mean, Birch's Garden was up there. I think it was like, you know, 875 meters high. I mean, that's pretty tall. And we flew out to, got out to the chopper pad and sat on there. And you're on the middle of, it was on two mountain tops with a saddle in between it. Mm -hmm. And the artillery was on this side, and mortars was on this side, and then it had bunkers around it and Constantina ware. And that's where all the, all the, Grunts took their, you know, pulled guard. That's where you pulled guard and stuff. And, and uh, got out there and finally got to meet Susie, which 
his name was actually Roland. Mm -hmm. Everybody just called him Susie, and that was the big joke. Of the, you know, everybody, they, they, everybody had the big laugh on the, the new guy that, you know, oh, yeah, he thought we were going to, you know, okay. So they put me in a hooch, and I uh, buddied up with the, they put me in my squad, which uh, George Bordwine was the squad leader, and he was the gunner. There was only like four of us on the gun. Uh, there were four mortars, three mortars on the on the mountaintop on our side of the mountaintop. Um, two HE with high explosives in it, and then we had down at the saddle where the helicopters land, we had a, a mortar pit down there. But that just fired illumination, so when something happened, you'd fire illumination to light up to see what was going on. And the HE pits didn't have that; they didn't have. HE down at the, the illumination pit, and uh, but I worked with George up in the up on the, the mortar, up on the HE pit, and it's right on the side of the mountain. I mean, you look over the side, Constantine wire, just whew, nothing but air. I mean, just right straight down the mountain, and George and I got along really great. He, you know, he was the best there was at the time. Um, but then we had Bennett, who would came in with me. He was already out there. We had went through AIT and BASIC together, and Bennett was North Car from North Carolina. He worked in the furniture factory. And so he, he was my ammo bearer. I ended up being the gunner, and George ended up being the squad leader. At what point did you become the gunner? Was that right, right away? that day. Okay. Yeah, right that day. And it was the whole thing was, you know, at that point, right then, it was... You know, I was in competition with George. He was the best, okay? And I'll get to George in a minute, but I had a lot to live up to. I mean, he was the best. And, of course, I just came from the States, and I was the best, you know? So, yeah, I was a gunner that day. And I, if Bennett was, would fire, he'd cut the charges off the rounds and drop them down the tube, and I'd set the gun up, and we'd fire, I mean, right from that moment. And... I've got a picture of George and I standing together because we both carried our thump guns. And George was, um, it was a, the picture was taken on George's birthday and he had just turned uh, 17. And he'd been there six months. How did that work? His mother and parents signed him up. And he, was, he turned 17 and the picture, and I, I'd just gotten country and he'd been there six months. But George was good. I mean, and he taught me everything, everything I could possibly know about, know about George. I mean, know about Vietnam. And if you didn't buddy up with somebody when you were there, your chance of, of making it was maybe two weeks. Yeah. I mean, not everybody got a very good reception when they joined the unit. It yeah. depended a lot on just what unit you were with and who the guys were, I guess. Right. But, but in this case, you had people right away who were kind of telling you what to do and giving you some responsibility and yeah. so forth. So were you firing the mortar from the very first day? The very first day, yeah. Okay. What, what we had out there, we had a thing called a mad minute. Okay, so at this particular time every night, you'd fire everything. So that's where I got my experience. You know, you just fire the mortar and you just, just to fire it. You know, you didn't make any difference. You know, they chop you in some more if you want. You know, when you got done the next day, and you'd fire it. Our pit was built right along the edge of the mountain. And it, like I say, it was right straight down to the valley from, from there. And we'd fire them up at zero charge and try and catch them as they went by outside the pit. Which, you know, the stupidity of a 19-year-old, the first thing is, you know, if you hit the end of it, it's probably going to explode. If you do catch it, it's probably just going to rip your arm off, you know, because there's fins, tail fins. It's just going to mess you right now. But it was, just the, it was just the idea that, you know, maybe we could do this, you know. Mm -hmm. but, We'd have a mad minute, and it'd be dark. Uh, it usually was around 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And everybody on the bunker line would start opening up, throwing grenades, firing firing their, their 60s and their 16s, and when thumping guns, I'd fire my thumping gun, fire the mortar. Um, Did they tell you what the logic was of doing that? Um, no. Uh, we just figured it was just so we could get practice firing things, and maybe whatever was there might scare away. Well, this went for, I was there less than a month, 
And we did that, and they had the bright idea, okay, we've been doing this every night. This comes down from the big guys, right? We've been doing this. Artillery is firing, too. Mm -hmm. We do this every night at this time. Let's screw them up and do another one. So they, all, they decided 10 minutes after we do the first one, we're going to do another one, you know, just to screw things up. Sure enough, we did. We always sit on the bunker line every night and watch Kurhi down in the valley. They would get overrun every night. They'd get hit every night, and you'd watch the green tracers and the mortars and the red tracers going in and out and the, all the flashes from the grenades and artillery and everything. We'd sit on the bunker line and, with the, and watch that every night you know, down the hill. They were down in the valley. We'd sit and watch them every night. This night, they didn't, it didn't happen. We, you know, we were all bummed, you know, so we're back in, going to play cards, and our, you know, mad minute time for our mad minute came up. We had our mad minute, and we all went back in the hooch, and we're going to play cards again. And, you know, we got five, ten minutes, but we got to get back out there. And so we're, everybody's getting everything, getting back out there, and we start having our next mad minute. Well, the gooks were coming after us that night. And when we had our mad minute, they thought we had spotted them, that they had been seen. They hadn't. They were coming up through the garbage dump and, you know, all around the mountain and coming up after us. And so how did you know they were there? When they started shooting. Okay. Yeah, when things start coming back and, you, you know, wait a minute, <laughs> this is all something going on. You can, I could actually sit and hear the, the mortar rounds come and they were walking like at a Z down the mountain. And they, they got our number one gun at the top, the HE gun at the top. And then they were trying, mine was kind of over, but they missed it. And then we're coming down, and I don't know if they ran out or decided to change, but they just, that's as far as they got. So they're, they're coming after us. I mean, they're coming up the hill. And matter of fact, they're in the wire. I mean, they're so close that, you know, you can see the muzzle flashes. Um, well, now that our number one gun is out, our number one HE gun is out, because it's been hit by the mortars, um, Bennett and I went down to work the illumination. Bennett's popping illumination. And I'm running up to the HE pit and getting some HE mortars and bringing them down to that gun so I can help fire that gun besides firing illumination. Mm -hmm. So I'm running up and down the side of the mountain. You know, we've got like ammo crates put in it like steps. And then the pit wall is about yay high, and it's sandbag, and and uh, I'm running up, grabbing three rounds, and running down, putting them down there. And George is firing that gun, and I'm running back up, getting three. Bennett's firing the one, the illumination, the round, bringing the rounds down too. And you know, things get tight. You know, we can get you know from the other pit and, and do that. And I run it back and forth, and I come running down with three and throw them down, and go to run back up, and somebody grabs my leg, and I trip and fall on these boxes that we got for steps and I mean I'm hurt and I'm pissed what the hell you know what's this out that out somebody grabbed my leg and tripped me you know put me down well I, by the time I got done rolling around and Bennett's looking out around the corner and he says you can't do that he says they're shooting at you every time you run up that hill and I mean sure enough there's our the dump and it's right where I'm running that's the opening for our the illumination gun mm -hmm. So by him tripping me, probably saved my life. Now, how did you know what to shoot at with the mortar at that point? When um, you're firing you have what you call DTs, Delta Tangos, and they're, they're uh, designated targets. So when you're not doing something, which not very often, but on a, on a fire base, you're shooting these Delta Tangos, and um, you've got them all numbered. And somebody will sell, say, you know, you don't have to have a, you've you got it on your board. You know where this one, they'll say, you know, I need it at Delta Tango, right. you know, whatever. And you know where that is. And you, you they need it, you need it right there, what, you know, they'll, I need it uh, a yard from there, or two yards, whatever, you know, 100 yards, or whatever. So you just fire it. Because mm -hmm. everybody out there is coming at you. And they hope, nobody out there you're going to kill that can make any difference to right. you or to, you know, not get you into trouble. So. You just, you set them up and you fire. You don't necessarily wait. Um, what you do wait for is if you get a call and they say that they've seen uh, a mortar or a, somebody, you know, an area where there's a group of guys, you know, Vietnamese coming mm -hmm. after you or coming up there or if they see a mortar 
tube that's firing at you, mm -hmm. and then your your job is to take the tube out, right. to take that, that stuff out. So in all of this, you're doing all these things. I mean, you're shooting illumination to light up the fire base so that the grunts you know, can see, mm -hmm. you know, the guys in the bunkers can see if somebody's coming up, and then you're firing the other ones to keep whoever's coming up away from the edge of your, but you know how far out you can fire. I mean, you don't have any friendlies out there, so as long as you clear the bunker line, you know, you got to be so many yards out past the bunker line. You, you know, they danger close is what they call it for the other ones, and you can't fire within that area. How long did that firefight last, do you think? Um, it started probably around dark, about right after our first things, probably around 10 o'clock, I think it started in the evening. It lasted about until daybreak. So it was a fairly serious ongoing thing. Yeah, they, they sent a group, good sized group to come up. Yeah. We ended up with uh, 37 bodies inside the wire. Mm -hmm. They were going after artillery, so that was the other mountain top. Mm -hmm. So they were coming up from that, trying to get over to artillery, although they were shooting at everybody. But uh, they had 37 um, guys in the wire, you know, mm -hmm. bodies in, inside, the, inside the fire base. Um, the, they were going after the artillery tack, which is the, the control. Right. Um, and they did wound the uh, artillery commander, uh, but most of them were, you know, a good shot were found around artillery. But there were 37. And then in the morning, they, you know, you're out policing everything up and cleaning everything up. And we took all the bodies that we laid out cargo net and piled all the bodies up on the cargo net. And, and I mean, it probably six, seven foot tall, just all these bodies that we had piled up there, and, and uh, they were like mannequins, wax mannequins. I mean, you don't think of them as being anything more than that. And you had never seen a dead body before, had never. you? Never. No. Yeah. no, no, other than in a suit and tie and a coffin, you know. So that's quite a, and this is, you know, I've only been in country maybe a month mm -hmm. from being going, you go through a week of P training when you first get in, that's when they get used to you and sending you to your unit when you're at uh, Benoit, and then mm -hmm. sitting on the chopper pad for three days, and then getting out there. So, yeah, about a month, and, and we were overrun. I was in a place, with, you know, and of course, now I'm not a cheery because you know they dropped yeah. the cheery because you've been in a, in a firefight. And that. Was that the only major fight you had while you were uh, at Berkeley's Garden? At Birch's Garden, um, yeah, right after that when they pulled everybody, the monsoons were coming, mm -hmm. so they pulled everybody. They were taking everybody off from the, off from the valley, off from the out of the that area of the, the country, um, because they couldn't get helicopters in. Um, it clouded up so bad that uh, you couldn't see. Uh, like, I mean, you could s stick your arm out into a cloud, and it was like your arm was gone. I mean, you couldn't see from your elbow down. Was, mm -hmm. That was a cloud. And that was how thick it got. In between that and the rain, they just couldn't resupply you. It was really hard to hump in, in the jungle in the rain because it, the it was just, everything was just so slimy, mm -hmm. so dead and slimy and rotted, and you know everything was just crumbling. Back to the guys, we put all the guys in a all the the bodies we had. We put them in a cargo net and put our death cards on them and uh, hooked the cargo net up to a chinook. A chinook came in. We hooked the cargo net up to a chinook, had them fly them out over the valley, and let go. It rained bodies for quite some time. And you said death cards. What? You had that a, at that time. You they it was before they banned them. That it was it was a a card saying who you were. And a lot of them were playing cards. They were like playing cards, mm -hmm. and it, our playing cards had it, they were all the same card, Ace of Spades. Mm -hmm. um, being the second of the 506, um, our unit designation is a spade. Mm -hmm. um, the, like the 50 deuce is a heart. Mm -hmm. During World War II, this happened. They had right. a paint on their, the backs of their helmets, right. so they could designate that the unit that you were from. So ours were spades. So we had all the aces of spades. So you're sort of sending a message to the enemy in effect by attaching the cards to them and then just depositing them. Literally, yeah. so you're making it literally all there. through the whole jungle because I mean yeah. I'm sure they covered a you know 15 20 mile area by the time they oh yeah yeah we stuck you know put them in their mouths mm -hmm. and, um, 
once we were done that and collecting a few odd items, um, they were you know, taken away. And then, then the next day is when I got my really best sunburn. Um, my whole body, I mean, I was sunburned because they brought in all this ammo. And I mean, it's helicopter after mm -hmm. helicopter bringing in ammo and new, a new gun, and we had to rebuild that pit. Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking, humping up these stairs that we build all these ammo boxes up the side of the mountain to put the, and you're carrying a carton, a, a, a box. Mortars come in a box that weighs 56 pounds, mm -hmm. and there's three mortars in there, and you carry one on each shoulder, and when you got good, you had one crossways, so you had three mortar boxes on your shoulders, and you know once you got the strength, we, I, I could do two. That was, uh, you know, so the the thing goes on the the, the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. You're running these all day long, and you know, open them up and putting them in the the gun the all our tubes, all our guns were, one wall was nothing but mortar tubes, um, empty tubes, and you put the new mortars in it. So that way they were all open and they were covered with a sheet of plastic. But then you'd pull them out to, to fire them. Now did you run through the, that ammunition before they abandoned the fire base? or Because uh, you leave the fire base and then they, they blow it up behind you? Or? Yeah. We left the fire base and, and uh, we actually it was just, it was probably three weeks to a month after we were overrun that we left and they took us back to Camp, Camp Evans. Evans. Okay, this tape is about... Okay, so we were kind of closing out uh, your, your time there at that Berkshire it, Garden. Berkshire's All right. Garden. Yeah. And about how long overall do you think you were there? Maybe six weeks or two uh, months? I don't or? even think six weeks. Okay. No, I would say, you know, Four, four or five, or four or five. Yeah, okay. maybe you know, it might have been close to six. But I don't okay. think we were there. After that big attack, uh, did the enemy try again, or? Um, I don't recall anything going on after that. Now, would they periodically just lob mortar rounds at, at, at the base, or snipe at it, or? Generally, they'd send in. Um, they they'd hit you with mortar rounds, and then they'd send in uh, sappers. Mm -hmm. And what they do is, you know, these guys would run up to the Constantina wire, and one of them would just lay himself on top of it, and the rest of them would run up his back to get through the wire. I mean, that stuff about them crawling through the wire, mm -hmm. that's, you know, maybe when they first started doing it, they were trying to be a little sneaky, but when it came to a sapper attack, they'd just run up, and one guy would throw himself on the wire, and... Uh, if he had a satchel charge or something, maybe they'd blow it, but generally speaking, they all just carried satchel charges, and they'd run from hooch to hooch or, you know, where they thought the, the talk was at, you mm -hmm. know, to get bigger name people rather right. than just, you know, just a lowly, you know, run on the, on the, the bunker line. Okay, so the guys, so the, they didn't necessarily attack you on the perimeter. They would go in and look for the main target. They'd make it, yeah. They did. They'd kind of get you going on one side or another, and then kind of sneak in. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot like when you get into uh, an ambush or, or you know, you, we, when I after we did Birch's Garden, we clo they closed that out, and then they probably just bombed most of it into oblivion. Um, then we went to Eagle Beach and spent a week at Eagle Beach. That was just, it was during a typhoon. So, you know, they have these big towers you're standing in. They're, they're like these huge telephone poles. There's four of them, and then there's a deck with a little thatched roof on it. And I don't know if you're watching for submarines or what, but you had to pull guard. Mm -hmm. And I happened to get it the night of the, the typhoon come through. So we just tied ourselves to the big poles. And set through the went through the typhoon that way, and I mean everything's you know blowing over. But at Eagle Beach, there were uh, it was uh, CVs, and there was large uh, petroleum um, containers. Mm -hmm. That's where they kept a lot of the fuel. And then, so and that was down by way. And so that, that was a little bit south. So that was basically in country R and R, or it was supposed to be. Kind of like an in country R and R, yeah, right. yeah. But it was actually, you know, they just, I don't know, they, they'd have these Vietnamese or 
Korean groups come in and sing all these American songs, and there's free beer. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. all the beer you could drink, and you know, it was good food because there was a, a CB base there, so that you could go through their their mess hall. We broke into it a couple of times to get stuff that when they weren't open. But, um, then we ended up going back up north and and uh, uh, going to different fire bases. Uh, we worked off from. Uh, Firebase Jack, and that was kind of in the lowlands, and the mountains on one side, and the you know flatlands on the other side, and waiting for the monsoons, and you kind of then we came and kind of circled our area of operations and headed up and took over for the the Marines up the DMZ. So we worked the rock pile and and uh, Camp Carroll, and, and the Marines were pulling out at that time. They were Third Marine Battalion was leaving, and we were taking over for them. And, um, so we ended up being up there at the, at the rock pile, which supposedly the Marines had been overrun on like four or five times or six times or something, and we couldn't even stay on it, let alone have somebody overrunning. I mean, it was, it was just s straight up and down, and it was this red clay, and if you got out of your, your foxhole or your bunker, um, you had to tie a rope around your waist because we'd have guys that slid right down the side of the mountain through the Constantina wire and everything. And I mean, it was just so slippery and, you know, you couldn't get a footing. So how, there was only one way up. It was on a ridge line. There was only one way up it. I don't know how, they built a huge chopper pad on top of it. Well, they had to build this. It looked like a deck. It looks like a huge deck from nowadays. Enough to land a helicopter on because it was so pointed you couldn't land a helicopter on top of this mountain because it was just so steep. So they built this huge chopper pad on top of the deck, on top of the mountain, so they could just land and drop drop supplies off. How long were you staying at these places? They take you your your. It would all depend. We'd go in there and, and work the area and, and see how much activity was going on, what we, what we'd run into. Mm -hmm. um, like at the DMZ, you you kind of see how many you know. The, what, if there was a big force building up there, then you'd go and work on that, and then then they'd rotate you out and bring in another unit. That was the way we worked. Our unit was we went in first and set things up as far as you know secured the area. Mm -hmm. So and you know and just recon the area to find out what was going on, to find out if. Uh, well, work is, work was uh, just that was your job. What your job was to walk around the mountains and walk around the jungle and find out who was out there, mm -hmm. so and find find, find find people and kill them. I mean, basically, that was that was work. That was yeah. what the government was paying us for. We were paid. Now, as a mortar crewman, would you normally stay on the fire base and then we go out, or would you go out and patrol with them? Well, when normally we'd go to from fire base to fire base and set, you know. We'd be one of the first ones out to set up the fire base mm -hmm. as far as sec uh, for security. I mm -hmm. mean, they bring other people out that would dig the bunkers, but you'd go out there and you'd dig a, dig a hole to put your gun up on or, you know, your, your tube, and you'd just be out there with the line company, and then they'd start bringing people in, and you'd move, we'd move off. And we used to uh, hump the, our mortars with, um, we humped a lot with Chuck Hawkins from Alpha Company. And... Chuck liked this, he called us as uh, mobile artillery, so we did a lot with, with you know, humping mortars with him. But we'd go out and hump and you'd go out, you may be out for 30 days or, you know, six weeks, you know, four, five, six weeks, and then they'd bring you back into a fire base and that was kind of our little R&R, &R. you know, they'd send another tube out mm -hmm. to, to be with them so that we kind of, we would get we would get, it was our refresher kind of thing. We'd get a, a break and get our, be able to get our act together and get clean clothes and, and, uh, and a shower maybe, um, and just some normal food sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now would this just be your squad that would be attached to a unit or would the whole platoon go or? No, it'd just be my squad. So you're bringing one mortar tube with you and the four guys and you're just attached and so you're the, you're the portable artillery for the, the companies right. that are out there patrolling. So right. you are out there with them. So then you had all these people you're out fighting against, the Vietnamese, that didn't like you. Mm -hmm. But you're with all these U.S. Army guys that didn't like you. 
because every grunt, every all the line guys had to carry two mortar rounds. We had to carry the same thing, but we had to carry, everybody had to carry 250 rounds of, of machine gun ammunition. Well, that came down to us too. We had to carry a rifle. We, you know, I had my, and I started out with a thump gun, but then I went to a 16, I went to a, an XM203, an over and under. Um, but we had to do the same thing. We had to carry a full load of ammunition, you know, 21 magazines. If you had a, a, an M16, 21 magazines, uh, a dozen grenades, two blocks of C4, two, two claymores, a, a law. Um, if you were humping the, uh, the mortar, you had to, I was a gunner, so I humped the sight. And, you know, Bennett humped the, the base plate, and uh, Dave McCain humped the, the the two, I mean, you're talking the base plate's 60 pounds. You put that in your rucksack, and your rucksack's already 85 to 100 pounds. So you know you're carrying a lot of weight. It doesn't, you know, you get on the helicopter, you get on the helicopter that stuff, and you get off of that stuff. It doesn't come later. It's not, you know, individually wrapped. You got it. Well, if you don't have it, you don't have it. If you're missing a, one of the parts of your gun, you might as well have left everything else behind because you don't have anything. So. We went out with Alpha Company with Chuck Hawkins, and and we'd hump, hump that, and everybody would hump them, you know, two mortar rounds, and they didn't like it, um, so they didn't like us, and so, but, you know, we really, you really, we really didn't get to know them, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't know the, we didn't know the line guys uh, that we were with. I mean, we were out with them, and we'd be out with them for months at a time, but basically it was more long. The only way you got to really know them. Um, was trading food and cigarettes and mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing. Now, when you're out there in the field with, with a line company, about how many soldiers would these companies usually have? Um, a normal company would have 120 guys. Right. Um, we were never normal. Um, you might be out there with you know 45. You know, not very many guys. Because yeah. you were also in, in, involved in, in the ripcord operation, and some of the companies that were fighting around that fire base were down to 30 or even 15. Uh, at, at certain points, so right. not really big groups. We got down to where it was just three of us in the mortar. Um, George left, you know, and then it became Bennett left. Bennett got called to the. They took him out of our my squad and took him down to the first cal. Uh, they needed guys down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we needed them too. But I lost Bennett, and I had uh, it was myself and McCain, and uh, did they give you a replacement at that point? Did you get a new guy? No. Okay. No, we didn't. We had, you know, we dealt with who we had. So you became everybody. Um, you know, Pops was a, Pops, I was going to tell you about the older guy, but he was our FDC, our fire direction control. And he was a college graduate. So when he came, we were all 19, he's 25. So that's how he got the name Pops. Mm -hmm. And to this day, when he calls and he says, hey, this is Pops, or, you know, I always, you know, when we get together, everybody calls him Pops. You know, I mean, that's just him, that's the whole thing. But um, most of the guys that we were with, uh, Pops didn't hump with us. Pops was at the fire base. Um, um, I was trying to remember at the last reunion. He was at the last reunion. We had dinner with Kilgore. him. Kilgore. Kilgore. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kilgore. James. I didn't know his first name until we had a reunion, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Kilgore, everybody called him Kilgore. No matter, everybody had a nickname. Nobody had, nobody was called by the, you know, I was always called Whip. You know, and even today. Um, so everybody had Tennessee. Tennessee, his name was Tennessee. Um, I think McCain, I just called him McCain. I mean, that was, you really didn't get to, you know, you were close. But yet you were distant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't want to know anybody that well because, you know, they were just going to die, and you know, you didn't need that extra burden. And and for me, my burden being a squad leader and, and was my guys. Um, it it takes a, a real load. I mean, yeah, you don't want to be a squad leader, you know, because you know, you then you have to. I had to not only take care of myself, but take care of them and you know, make sure that they had what they needed and, you know, didn't want them to get hurt, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a real hard thing. Now, did you spend a, a full 12-month tour in Vietnam? Okay. I spent all 
12 months in Vietnam. I had uh, a R and R, a week's worth of R and R, which actually ended up taking up 10 days. Um, my P training, which was a week coming in country, and the three days I spent on the on the fire base, and the seven days that I spent at the middle of my tour, they brought us back for what they call a refresher training mm -hmm. to tell us what was going on in the area and who we were fighting against and what they were doing, the kind of booby traps they were using, and the weapons. Um, total of uh, all but 31 days, I was out in the in the jungle. Mm -hmm. Now, after that initial assignment down by the Aisha, were you uh, pretty much up in that northern part of Vietnam the rest of the time? Up no. along the DM, or did they? We just we took over for the Marines up there, mm -hmm. secured that area, yeah. um, got the you know things back in kind of an mm -hmm. operating order, and then they brought in Arvins, and they brought in you know other people right. from other parts of the 101st or different units mm -hmm. that w that would take over up there. And then we'd go to someplace else, and we rotated back down. We're following the monsoons now, and the monsoons kind of go around the country. So now we're up the top, the DMZ, the top of the country, the north, and the monsoons are coming back, going back down, so we're coming back into the valley. Mm -hmm. So now we're working, coming in, like, you know, Camp Carroll and then Quezon, and um, we started in it. Actually, we started in at the bottom of the country, and they wanted to build a road up through the Asia. Mm -hmm. So we started out at, at uh, uh, Birmingham and went to Bastogne. All the 101st fire bases mm -hmm. were named after World War II battles. Right. So the fire base, the first one you came to at the bottom of the valley was, was Birmingham, and then you went to Bastogne, and then we went up through the valley. And we went up with the line company, and they were try going to try and we were going to clear the area, and they were going to come in with engineers and build a road after we, you know, checked out the area and made sure that, you know, we got whoever was in there out mm -hmm. and, you know, find out what kind of, who they'd have to fight against, you know, the kind of battles that they'd have. That's still fairly far north though in South Vietnam, it's still I-Corps sector, not farther down. That's so you're not you're not down by Saigon or the Cambodian border. No, no, we never pretty much up, up they north. divide the country into five different corps. Right, right. And we were in I Corps. Yeah. Actually we were in northern I Corps, so mm -hmm. it's you know, if I Corps is this big, we were just in right. this part of it. Right. And that was just yeah. up from way north. Okay. Now over the course of, of the, this year that we're you're with the unit, how would you characterize the morale of uh, the men in the ranks at this point? Um we were good. We were all we were so good that we we loved what we were doing. Um, the morale, the uh, we were never in the rear where we had a problems. You mm -hmm. know, the cooks and the thing guys in the rear were were mostly your problems with. The guys out in the field, um, it was a family. I, again, you know, you didn't want to be close, you couldn't help. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a family. I mean, I don't care if you didn't know the guy's first name. You know. If something were to happen, you 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 know you were torn up. If something were to happen to him, even though you didn't, you know, mm -hmm. but you were close. You were a family, um, and we were good. The whole unit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went through and we did what we were supposed to be doing. Um, now, over the course of the year, you know, some men will become casualties. Others will simply rotate out. So you're getting new people coming in, and you go from being a cherry to being one of the old guys, and so forth. Did the you must performance stay at pretty much the same level the whole time? Yeah. Okay. And because we were good. Not because, you know, the quality of the guy coming in. Mm -hmm. It was because we were good and we could teach him, right. this is how you're good. Mm -hmm. This is how to be good. And it, how you're, you're good is your, you know, your morale is up. You know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you, you, your friends, your, your family. I mean, a new guy comes in and yeah, you, he gets a ton of ribbon. I mean, everybody's on him about him being a cherry and um, all this other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and he always gets all. Well, the big thing we did with him when we we're out with the line companies and we get, or even on the fire base, we get a new guy in. Is you tell him all these stories. Oh yeah, this one guy got in. They came in and cut off his, you know, and did this and you know, and uh, all these nasty things, you know. And you got sleep. Because this guy was up all night, okay? You didn't have to worry about pulling guard. This guy was so scared, he wasn't going to sleep for a week. You got, that, that's what you did with a new guy. And you, you actually, you know, you cheated him out of his 
his sleep so you could have sleep. Because normally you'd get, you know, you'd be on for, you'd be on guard for an hour and then you'd be off for two, and then you'd be back on. So that was kind of, kind of a rotation. And so usually there was three guys in a, in a foxhole or if, when you were out and, and eight on the bunker line, that, you know, it was generally three guys. And so that way you, you got an hour on and two hours off. And that was the total amount of sleep you get because when you're daylight and you're moving, you're not, you know, you're not able to, and when it's nighttime, you're not able to sleep any more than that. And so when you got a new guy, you used him and, you know, talk, and just gave him everything to carry. Oh, you're going to need this. And, you know, so you'd load him down with everything you could find. And, but you were giving him attention because sometimes new guys would come in and get ignored. You know. No, I don't think any of them got ignored. Not in your no, not in our not in our right. We were different. We were, you know, like I said, we were we were really different. I think. How much of a sense did you have of what was going on in the larger war or conflict uh, during the time you were there, or did you have much of a sense of where what you were doing fit into any larger plan? Um, we get newspapers. I mean, I used to get a newspaper in the mail and. You get an idea of what was going on in the world and what they were talking about, but it never matched what was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I always had to, you know, write letters home that you know this, you know, this isn't what's really going on, you know, here. You know, it might be other places, but where we're at, you know. Um, but you never could tell them what was going on either. Mm -hmm. You know, because you didn't you want to scare the heck out of everybody. And most of my letters that I sent home saying, oh, it's raining here, the weather's terrible, you know, we don't get any sleep, and the things are nasty, the bugs, you know. That was all you could really, that's all you really dared to say. Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell about, you know, what was really going on. Now, did they send you stuff from home? Oh, yeah. What kinds of things would they send you? Uh, crumbled cookies and crumbled cakes. And <laughs> oh, they send you... They, the church would send you cookies, mm -hmm. and by the time you got them, it was just big one big jumble of. But I mean, when somebody got a care package from home, everybody was there to eat it. And I mean, that was like I said, that was family. Mm -hmm. That was you didn't oh, you can't have any. You're not part of our group, or you're you know, no. When when that opened up, it was gone in a heartbeat. Uh, didn't make any difference what it was. It'd be we get Kool Aid because mm -hmm. the water came in water blivets, and they tasted like. Tasted like rubber, and so you had to have something to pour in it. So you had, you get Kool-Aid, uh, gum, candy, um, just about anything. I, I, if it was fruit or anything like that, it was destroyed before. Nothing that would put up to the weather could make it, because mm -hmm. your mail wasn't necessarily. It wasn't a quick thing, you know. When you got mail, you know you may get mail once a week rather mm -hmm. than. You know, once a day. I mean, I don't think we ever got mail once a day. On a fire base, you might get mail once a day because of the choppers coming in and out. They throw out a mail bag and a clean clothes. Ketchup? Oh, yeah, we used to get. I, one of our pictures in, inside of one of our hooches, you can see we've got fresh onion and ketchup and Tabasco, and that was some that McCain had gotten were in his shelves. and. Did you normally just eat C rations and K rations, or just C rations? Just C rations. That's all we ever had. We'd get if we had a body count, we'd get clean clothes and ice cream. So that was you will see on one of my helmets, and you'll see it on the other guys' helmets. Uh, everybody had their own little slogan, their saying, or you know, um, mine said that you know we kill for our ice cream, which was true because if we had a body count, they'd send out a helicopter, and they would generally send out. You know, ice cream and clean clothes. Mm -hmm. Ice creams would come into um, ice cream would come in mermite, but by the time even you got it, it was you know pretty much melted away. Mm -hmm. um, the clean clothes would come in a big a big bag, and they dump the kick the bag out of the the helicopter on the middle of the landing pad, and everybody run out there and they grab it and just dump all the clothes in. So. <laughs> What you got was what you could grab quick. So, you know, if you were the last guy there, your clothes didn't necessarily fit you. I mean, you know, you may be a big guy and have on some smalls that you, know, you could find somebody to trade with or you wore what you had. Now, would the clothes deteriorate in, in that kind of They'd climate? They'd rot like no tomorrow. It, I mean, you didn't wear underwear. You had, you know, you did socks. I never took my boots off ever. I mean, day and night, you always had your boots on. You always had your clothes on. Unless you even going in the stream, when you, you know, 
you may take your shirt off the shower, but in the stream. But so what happens to your feet if you never take your boots off? Well, you take them off as far as you know to clean your feet, to wash mm -hmm. your feet in the powder room. But then you put your boots right back on. And the biggest thing you want is socks. And socks was the biggest thing to have. But the the clothes, you know, within a matter of weeks, your your shirt and pants would just shred. I mean, and you, if you got into any kind of uh, wait a minute vines or anything like that, they're like these humongous rose bushes. You know, no flowers, just thorns. But you get in those, it might take two, three guys to get you out. Mm -hmm. You happen to walk into one of those and you get trapped. You take two or three guys to chop you out of there with their machetes. And, and you don't dare move because you're getting torn up. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I anytime you got, you know, a cut, it got infected. So, you, you know, that was the one thing. That's why you always had your shirts down, your sleeves down, and always covered up to keep from getting infected. Mm -hmm. You get into leeches. You'd walk through the jungle, and, and you'd think it was raining. I mean, you'd hear this pitter-patter on the, on the leaves and the, the floor in the jungle, and it was kind of darker than normal, you know, and thinking it's raining, and leeches falling from the trees. How do you get rid of the leeches? You have a real good friend. Yeah, because you get leeches in places you don't want leeches, and you can't reach the leeches sometimes. So you got some friends that, and generally, if you you know you'd put a cigarette on them and mm -hmm. make them let go, or you'd pour um, our insect repellent on them, which our insect repellent was ninety five percent, seventy five percent D. Mm -hmm. Well, now if you buy insect repellent, it doesn't have more than seven percent D right. in it because it's so. You would pour those on the leeches. Because that would make them get off, but you'd have this, it'd go right into the, the sore that you had, mm -hmm. you know. So that would get infected. That's why so many guys, you know, your skin just, you know, rots away. You know. They tell you that, you know, this is going to happen. That, you know, because you don't have chlorine in the water, your teeth are going to go bad because, mm -hmm. you know, they tell you this. The government tells you this. And if you use the stuff, but you got to use the stuff to keep the bugs off from you and to get the leeches off from you. And that's why you see a lot of guys with, you know, strings tied or laces tied around their their knees and that and their, their boots blouse that's if the leeches got past your your boots and it got up into your, your secondary defense of which is a string around your at your knees so that's why you see a lot of those you know they weren't holding anything on other they're just protection to keep the leeches up so is that the kind of thing the other guys teach you pretty quickly when you get there or? oh yeah yeah leeches and checking your helmet and if you take your boots off to check those for not tarantulas, but uh, scorpions. We had some guys, you know, bit by scorpions, and you know, put your helmet. You set your helmet down, and you sit on it normally. And if you don't, you know, they crawl in there, and you put it on, and they'll sting you. And uh, jet, they weren't the, you know, the kind that would kill you, but um, it affect your nervous system, and you go into convulsions. I mean, we had quite a few guys that you had to have them shipped back. You know, call in a medevac to get them out to get them back to some a uh, little bit of care because we didn't have the care for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a lot more out there that was dangerous than just the Vietnamese themselves. Oh yeah, everything. Okay. I mean. Now, did you ever have um, South Vietnamese servicemen working with you, either as interpreters or Kit Carson scouts or anything like that that you can recall? It, it's some of the fire bases we did. Some companies mm -hmm. did. We didn't. Okay. Um, at one point we had one Chu Hoi when we were out on Ripcord. I mean, there were there were Vietnamese out there. They tried to bring in, you know, Arvins, and, mm -hmm. but it, they never went out with us. We never, I never dealt with an Arvin my whole life, my whole time there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, all right. Okay. Now, what phase of the part of the Ripcord operation were you involved with? The Is whole thing from April when we went up the went up the mountain. The, they had been a fire base before, mm -hmm. and then they. Had, abandoned it and now we're coming back we're coming back to work the valley again and um, the Ashaw Valley the Ashaw Valley yeah. and that was the that was the, the thing you worked that area and then you moved because of the monsoons and gave it back and but at this time when we went back in for the for ripcord they had stopped the bombing and the Vietnamese were bringing down a lot of big stuff um, and actually that was what they called their warehouse area we hit some caves where there were brand new clothes in the caves. Um, 
bunkers, uh, uh, the roofs on bunkers would be three, maybe logs on the top of the, the bunkers, and three logs this big around stacked on top of one another. So, I mean, a 500-pound bomb isn't going to make a dent in that thing. That's the kind of things we ran into, a lot of bunkers like that. They'd come in through their, they didn't mind the monsoons, they weren't flying helicopters in. So they were building. And they built all this warehouse area in there, and they, they built all these huge bunkers, and they brought on these all 122 mortars, what they brought down, big guns, artillery, almost artillery. And they were bringing artillery down. They were bringing, they were to bring tanks down. Um, we were out, at one time when we were out with Chuck Hawkins, they ran across a, a phone cable this big around in the running down through the jungle floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was that heavy an area they had that much communications. I mean, it was huge. And we we ran into one cave where we found brand new Mickey Mouse sweatshirts. I mean, what are the odds that you'd run, you know, something like that? Mickey Mouse printed on the front of them. How intense was, was the fighting around there when you're in that operation? Ripcord was the worst we'd ever had. And uh, they wanted it bad, and we were out, the, we were a big thorn in their side. Uh, we had Ripcord, and I think Ripcord was about 850 meters high. They had Hill 1000, so they're 1,000 meters high. Uh, we tried to go in on 1,000, got nailed quite a few times, got, got booted back. I'm um, going up Ripcord, got booted out quite a few times. Finally got up there and they started building the rip. We secured it basically, mm -hmm. and, and they started building the fire base. And um, they brought in another set of mortars, so we took our mortars out and went with Chuck and worked that area. I mean, every place you went. I mean, we were in a. We got in, uh, flew in, helicopter in. We we're making a combat assault onto this ridge line, and. Uh, the huge mountain went this way and the ridge line came down and the mountain wasn't but a little on this side and then went back down and the ridge line was only this wide, maybe a third of the skid would would actually set on the, the ground. Mm -hmm. The rest would hang over each end. As we're getting out, we're getting mortared. As we're getting out of the helicopters, we're getting mortars and we're running out and first thing we run into is bunkers. Um, we find mortar rounds laying all over the place. Their mortar rounds, live ones. And you know, they, they just left. And we came in and they hauled ass, you know. So we came in and secured that for a little bit and took took a bunch of mortar rounds. We had a, they called in some. I thought it was a marine airplane. It was a a prop plane like they'd use in World War Two, yeah. and called in a couple two hundred pound bombs or something. And this ridge line was so steep. And I mean, at the you could watch the waterfall. It was you know, these beautiful things that you see, like we seen in Hawaii when we were in Hawaii. This beautiful coming out of the mountain, running down. And I mean, it was steep, and there's a stream down the you know, and this mountain slid down to it, and all just beautiful. And uh, we were getting mortared when we came came in on that. So they called in this this plane. Mm -hmm. I don't know who it was or who you know. I didn't wasn't privy to all that stuff. But he had a couple two hundred pounders. I'm guessing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I thought they were both supposed to land out here in front because that was where we were taking all the fire from. Well, one landed out there and the other one landed behind us. Unfortunately, this thing was you know so thin and narrow that it, you know if it had been flat, we'd have been all in big trouble. But unfortunately, it just went down the, down the mountain and blew up the side of the mountain a little bit, put a little pockmark in it. But we went from there and uh, we got we secured that. And uh, the next morning, we got up and we're starting to walk down through the jungle and. We'd gotten a new point guy. Uh, I, I find out later um, by reading um, in the book, uh, Ripcord, that, uh, it, reading Chuck Hawkins' uh, his account of his account of everything, yeah. Um, we had a, a, it was a new, he had a new uh, point man, and uh, he'd only been in the country a few weeks. and. Why they even had him up there at Point wasn't real sure, but it was uh, Whelan Norris, Chuck Norris's brother. And he walked up to a, a bomb crater and they had a 51 caliber setting up on the other side. And it killed him and, and uh, it's the next man, the slap man. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so I know everybody, you know, everybody went down and, and that was when I really got my first, um, we'd been in things, situations like that before, but that was one of the first time I got where I, I could actually see them, they were going to flank us. You know, this was to take our, take everybody to the front and everybody ran up the front and everybody's, you know, hollering to shoot up their weapons, you know, the two that were down shoot up their weapons and then to get up there and but they were running through the the jungle down the side of the mountain and going to come around to the side and that was the first time I'd ever really seen that in action mm -hmm. you know you, it's like a football play on TV you yeah. don't really you know you hear about this play and the, that was the first time I'd actually seen something like that you know work out um, we got a medevac in and nothing ever came of it I mean we were there was a little bit of a firefight but I don't know how long it lasted or anything. I don't remember much about it other than uh, getting, you know, getting the meta back in and getting those guys out. We were out again with them. You know, it was just a rough time at that time. I don't remember much about that one mm -hmm. after that. So it's just kind of a way, kind of a blur because you're out there, you're marching around in the jungle, you're under fire periodically. Yeah, because I don't know why. Yeah, I don't remember leaving. You know getting back to the fire base. Um, we went out again because we went out with a, a line company and and uh, I don't I don't think it was Chuck Hawkins that time we went out with, but we went out with another line company and uh, I could never figure it out. Uh, there was a, a illumination parachute in the next mountain over in a tree. We were on one mountain and this is another mountain in the valley in between us and stuff. And we're out there with the line company and, and it just got to be, you know, they didn't like us, we didn't, you know, we knew they didn't, but we got a, a bet going that, you know, but we can shoot that, you know, we're so good, we can shoot that parachute out of that tree with, a, with three rounds, mm -hmm. you know, so we get out, everybody's putting all their money together, I mean, just the three of us, I mean, we probably couldn't come up with more than 75, 80 bucks or something, but they were betting all this money that, you know, hey, you can't do that, you guys, you know, and uh, I always tell the story uh, that, uh, we took it out in two rounds. You know, pretty impressive. We do that. And we were down to the Ripcord reunion, and Pops was there, and I was telling that story. And, and Pops looks at me, and he says, uh, "He says, Whip, you took that out with the first round." I says, "Yeah, but doesn't that sound kind of you know, <laughs> brazen to say that I got it with the first round?" I said, "Doesn't that sound better if I got it the second round? I said, it makes me feel better." So. But that was, you know, just one, why, and I, I've always asked him I, to this day, and, and then one of the things that really got me going when I first got my, had my PTSD was the fact that it went back to that day, and here we're, you know, around Ripcord, and why are they letting us shoot mortar rounds at a parachute? Mm -hmm. Now, somehow, way or another, we would have had to get some sort of clearance from mm -hmm. above to be able to, I mean, unless you're under attack, uh, in you know, in a firefighter, where you need, why are you wasting three rounds? Why are these guys hump these rounds out there? They're, they don't like us anyway. Did they just want to lighten their load three rounds, mm -hmm. or you know, and why? Why were we even able to do this? Well, how, I'm not sure how tightly a, a company was going to be supervised when it's just sort of marching around. I mean, you'll get orders from above or something, but you weren't in an area that had civilians in it. So, oh, no. so that restriction wasn't there. Wouldn't have been anything like that. But, yeah, and so. They, but it was in it, it was at a time where, you know, when you got into something, they said, you know, if you called for more artillery, they'd say, and, you know, you're almost at your limit. You're almost they used your allotment for the, for the time, you know. It doesn't make sense that, you know, and you got you know, all these Vietnamese around you. Why would you want to? I mean, I, I, granted, it's, you know, we don't have a, lights up there showing them where we're at, but I mean, if the mortar going off doesn't tell them where to, where to look for you, what's going to, you know? What, it doesn't make sense. It never has made sense. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things, you know, I asked Pops, and it must have came down from somebody that we could do that. Oh. If we didn't have, you know, other than the, the whoever was the, I don't know, I can't remember his name, but it seems like it was Charlie Company that we were with, but whether the commander, you know, the, the captain of that company, why would he even do that? None of it would make sense. Well, Cap 
company commanders rotated through pretty quickly there too, uh, so maybe the guy didn't know any better. I don't know. We don't know. But just do you remember that? And it struck you as being really kind of strange. Now, you mentioned in the process that you're starting to see kind of rationing of ammunition and, and resources. You have your, a quota of artillery you can call them, that kind of thing. Now, was that true throughout the whole time you were in Vietnam, no. or did that change over time? At that point in time at Ripcord, um, I don't. They were really trying to downplay Ripcord. There was no. There's no mention of Ripcord until 30 years later. I mean, nothing, and now all of a sudden, you know, in the VFW magazine, we were number one at being, having 71 guys killed in one battle. Mm -hmm. What can, you know, more than they had to case on, you know, all of a sudden, more than were killed at Hamburger Hill. We're, we're number one. Ripcord was number one. one. One battle, we had lost 71 guys, you know. And I, I know for a fact, you know, we lost a lot more than that. I mean, we lost almost 500, it, but it went on from April until mm -hmm. July. Mm -hmm. So in that time, I know for a fact, I mean, I got the paperwork that mm -hmm. you know, shows names and places and what happened. Um, but why, you know, why the distinction all of a sudden, you know, you never heard of it. But they were trying to keep it, you know, locate, they were trying to make it look like, you know, the Arvins were taking over, uh, the Arvins weren't out there. Um, and we, there were 450 of us, I believe, on, on the mountaintop and on the fire base mm -hmm. on Ripcord. And it was about the size of three football fields. And, I mean, I never really seen the other side. It's mm -hmm. not like you get up and you take a tour. Yeah. You know, you, you go down to, you know, whatever you have to do and use a latrine or pump ammo up from the chopper pad. Um, I only got to see my side of the, the mountain. And, you know, but according to books, now that have come out, you know, there was like 450 of us on the mm -hmm. mountain, but we were surrounded by 7,800 NBA regulars mm -hmm. from their major, you know. And of course, without the bombing, all these things were coming down, and they, we were being mortared regularly every day, every mm -hmm. night, tear gas every day, every night, um, rocketed, shot at, sniper fire. Every time I built my hooch underneath the chopper pad. Pretty good thinking. See, I thought they got PSP planking for the deck, steel roof. What a, I mean, I got a picture of me laying there, and there's a steel roof, you know, while we're building our hooch underneath this mm -hmm. chopper pad. We just you dig into the side of the mountain, and then you fill up eight sandbags and build your walls out in front. So you know your mountain on all your sides, and I got a steel roof and mountain all around me and off at the front. So did you have phases where you would be actually on the fire base and firing your mortar from there? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'd weeks. come back and you'd may go out with, with, with the line company and be out, you know, a week or two weeks or three mm -hmm. weeks. And then you'd come back to the fire base and they ro may rotate another gun out if, if they, they wanted another gun out. But our fortune or misfortune, uh, we were liked. Mm -hmm. They liked us and we were good. I mean, it just, you know, absolutely good. And that was the beauty of it and why, you know, it was hard to leave, even you know, to leave the country and leave those guys there. I mean, you you were such a good family and such a, you know, but um, we were just good. I mean, Chuck Hawkins didn't take anybody else. He took mm -hmm. us, and you know, we kind of volunteered, I guess. You know, we liked him. You know, good. we like to get out. You know, if you're on the fire base, you know, you're always you're always having to do something. Mm -hmm. Where we thought out there was more like, you know, the Boy Scouts, you're out camping or something. You know. And, can chat at a little bit more. What was it like to be out there at night, though? If you're out there on patrol, and there's a lot of enemy around in the area. Um, what you'd do is you'd go out, you'd hump down, you'd hump down a stretch of the jungle, and, and uh, depending upon whether you're humping up the mountain or down the mountain or across the ridge line or whatever, and you you'd hump along, and you had the line guys out in front of you. You can you you they're out there far enough. You can just they're just not quite out of view. I mean, that's how far space you are. You're not bunched up. So you're, you know, maybe, you know, probably 50, 75 yards apart individually. And you're humping along and you got your weapon and you're looking and watching everybody's, you know, nobody's really talking. It's all hand, move, hand gestures and that. Um, then you'd go by a spot and somebody make the gesture, you know, and you'd remember that spot. And then you'd keep on going and, and you'd wait for dusk and then when dusk came you'd set up. 
like you're going to set up your perimeter. This is going to be your base camp for the night. And then well into once it got dark, then you'd move back to that spot that everybody pointed to. So that, you know, if anybody's seen you set up, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be where you, they'd seen you. So you'd be in a different area. So in the middle of the night, you'd, you know, you'd set up. And you'd spend all night setting up. And then you'd set, you know, generally, you know, you'd set back to back. So if, if the guy, you know, you were with on guard, you know, went to fall asleep, doze off, you'd feel him, you know, it either startled you awake or you knew, you know, could wake him up if you were having to fall off, you know. But generally speaking, you know, there'd be three guys and, you know, you, everybody, when you're on guard, would sit back to back, depending upon, if you're out on something like that, you'd have two guys out. So you got less sleep and then you're out, you know, you get up in the morning and have your cigarettes and fix your coffee and start on your way to someplace else. Now, did it matter kind of which company you were out with in terms of how careful they were with all the security provisions and things? Yeah, some some were a little lax on. It didn't make any difference to what you did. It made you a lot more tense. Yeah. Um, and that's why I, we probably volunteered to go with, with Chuck at the off company that we knew what they were and they knew what we were and, and we just meshed. So we so. worked together because I know you know. A lot of them were, were lax with it, you know, a lot of smoking and the noise. Mm -hmm. you know, noise was a big thing. Noise was a real big thing. Now, when you're out there in the ripcord area, you're out at night. Would you get attacked at night? Would the enemy try to come in after you? Oh yeah. And yeah. What would you do when that happened? Um, get as close to the ground. You know, wish you dug a deeper hole. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you dig your little foxhole and you hope you dug a little, you know, I wish I would have made this a little deeper. I wish I was a little closer to somebody else. Um, if something started happening, that it, it, it just your adrenaline starts pumping and you don't know what you're doing. I mean, you just don't know what you're doing. Some guys don't do anything. Um, some guys, you know, you pick, have their weapon and be firing. Some guys will just hold their weapon up and shoot just to... Say they shot or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I was always, I was always leery about not having enough ammunition. So mm -hmm. I always kind of pretty conservative. You know, when I had the sixty, I, you know, most of those guys, you know, they didn't like it because I didn't. I was too conservative with it. Which I was always afraid of running out of ammunition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you can just go to the next corner and pick up. I mean, if a chopper can't get in, you're in the you know triple canopy jungle. And, and you, you mm -hmm. don't know if they're going to drop it where you're at or what you're going to have. So, uh, and, and really, you need, just need to lay down a base of fire to, mm -hmm. when things start happening. You don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, things are so they're just so wild that nothing in your wildest dreams can you know, can you, the can you anticipate. You the things you ate. The things we ate. Get away that. Get on the food. Uh, We'd eat whatever, you know, we, everything you carried was on your back and mm -hmm. most of it was water and ammunition. Right. Um, you didn't take a lot in food. Um, everybody usually would get a case of sea rations and you'd trade off what you didn't like and your cigarettes and whatever. Um, I usually carried mostly fruit and then, you know, you'd eat maybe once a day and make coffee and hot chocolate. You'd mm -hmm. have packets of hot chocolate and coffee. And, You'd make those, and um, you'd eat off whatever you could find. I mean, maybe somebody might have killed a snake, and you could, you know, have a little fry, fish, snake fry, and or a, you know, monkey or something. Because uh, you didn't, you know, food wasn't that big an option. It mm -hmm. wasn't something you were. It wasn't something you really relied on that much. I mean, you could go a whole day without having mm -hmm. eating anything, and then, you know, late in the afternoon have something, and you know, a pound cake or some crackers, and that would pretty well do you. But uh, I think it also made for the fact that uh, you weren't out having to take a crap all the time in the woods, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because you're kind of on your own on that. <laughs> that one, you have to kind of. I'm going to go over here. Well, mm -hmm. be sure and holler this word before you come back, you know. So. I think it kind of, your body kind of said, well, if you don't eat, you don't crap, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's hold off a little bit. Okay. Uh, now, in the time when you're kind of in, in the I-Corps sector there, 
by the ripcord or elsewhere. Are there particular kind of events or incidents or things that happen to you that kind of stand out uh, in your memory or that tend to come back to you that you haven't brought in here yet? No, the just shooting the you know the shooting the, the parachute was the biggest thing that that I don't always remember that. And, um, there are a few things that happened on ripcord. Um, I don't usually get into that one. Um, we were we were getting hit and. We were always getting hit. I mean, it was just a matter of, you know, things started coming in and how quick you could get, you'd start firing back. You know, um, so you'd start firing, you know, it's, we'd have the mortar up mm -hmm. within seconds. I mean, it was already set up. The, gun, the tubes are set, right. you know, the rounds are set in there. And, um, they'd call and, you know, we need, you know, we'd have them, you know, Delta Company called in and they were pretty much annihilated. I think the CO got a satchel charge in his chest. Um, I don't think, you know, at the time that they, we were talking to him on the radio, I don't think there was more than two of them that were actually alive at that point. Um, then that got you going, and then um, Chuck Hawkins called in. I don't remember if it was Chuck or I don't think it was. Somebody called in for, for, um, for Alpha Company, and needed some, they had some gooks coming after them, and they were, you know, fighting them off the best they could and that, and, and then they, somebody else was coming along, I don't remember how, where they went. Well, there were units patrolling around Ripcord all the time, and so they would get into trouble and they'd need fire support from wherever they could get it. Right. So would you talk to them, or would that be Pops that would talk That'd to them? That'd be Pops that would talk yeah. to them. Uh, they'd call into the talk. The talk was set up in a, its own bunker, mm -hmm. and then we had these landlines that came out. The radios, the phones like that got in my trailer. That's matter of fact, in the, my picture in my album, it shows that phone, and that's why I've got them. That, that those are the actual things that we, you know, the same things that we used. Would the bomb, enemy bombardments take out the landlines periodically? Would those get cut, or were those well enough buried that... I guess it could happen, I don't... But you don't remember that? Right? It never, nothing like that ever. Most of the, the, your landlines and stuff were right in the ground, so unless along the edge of the sandbags, unless something hit right on there, you know. I mean, we had a lot of them the top of my hooch. I've got pictures of the top of my hooch where it was all sandbagged and, you know, all this dirt would have been inside these green sandbags and my whole top of my hooch is brown because all the you know, sandbags are blown away you know, right. and so it's all covered with just brown but we were the way we had built our hooch I mean I could stand I could this was the top of my, the chopping pad and I could stand in a hooch and my head would just barely be a little bit to the chopper pad maybe my chin would could touch up the chopper pad my girl and the choppers be in, you'd be looking at the bottom and the tail rotors are going there and they're blowing all this stuff. And, but we could stand in there and stand in, in there and our pit wall was out here and the mountain went like this. Mm -hmm. But we could stand in our hooch and watch the helicopters on top of the roof be shot up. Watch the tracers come over our head. You could turn around and watch the tracers come in and shoot these things up. But because of the angle, mm -hmm. they, you know, they couldn't get us because of you know the way we were the way we were set up. But all these choppers they just they'd be up there, a Chinook came in one time and they just the whole side of it just started popping open. I mean, just pip, 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 all up down the side of it. And it just shuddered and sat down and, mm -hmm. and then they brought in another Chinook and we're gonna take take it apart. Mm -hmm. So they brought in this other Chinook and they'd hooked up these big straps, you know, pull straps up to this big road around the Chinook, four four blades on this big road around the on the back end of it. And, and other Chinook come in and the guy's standing on top of the other and he clicks it onto the bottom of the Chinook and, and uh, the Chinook pulls up, pulls out, disengages at the rotors and then he starts taking off. And they got to have kind of a downward motion to get a forward motion. Mm -hmm. So to come off the mountain, that's why you're up so high, so they can get going. They come off in that and this is trailing behind them. And it's a, mind you, it's a, probably a three or four inch strap, nylon belt strap, you know doubled up and everything and they come off the mountain and we're watching them and they finally they start leveling out and this rotor's behind them well it's turning the whole time it's behind them it's turning like this and that strap 
it's knotting right up. You know mm -hmm. how you, like a rubber band, you right. know, you do that and it knots right up. All of a sudden, you can see there's a the tail gunner. The there's a guy on the they got the back deck down and they've got a 60 mounted on it. The guy's laying on it. That's protection for coming in the ripcord. Mm -hmm. And you could just see him. I mean, I, I think you could have seen the whites of his eyes must have been like this. And this broker is right behind him. You know, it's getting closer and closer. And I, he must have called in. And all of a sudden, all the guys from the, the, the guns on the sides, because they got 60s out the side windows on the, on the Chinook. Mm -hmm. and the guys from the side are out looking out and looking at them act like this. And this rotor's coming back. Like, all of a sudden, the Chinook did one of these. And it just nosed up like that. And the propeller from the, the props from the other Chinook come down underneath and you could see the release when they released the cable mm -hmm. and that thing just fluttered through the air but it was it would have taken a while that thing fluttered through the air almost made it all the way back to ripcord well at that point they decided just to push them off the side of the mountain right. and burn them up mm -hmm. <laughs> so they you know they were full of fuel and uh, they left it's, well, you want a Chinook would burn in like three seconds because it's, you know, it's made out of uh, magnesium. Mm -hmm. So they just they just tear up right away and you know, just that was one thing you didn't want to be in as a Chinook that crashed. Okay. Now, did you do a lot of sort of counter battery fire? Did you try to hit the enemy mortars if you could or figure out where they were? We yeah we if we got a call in that you know pops would get the call and mm -hmm. they'd say you know either you know troops in the open or you know grouping or you know mass of troops and you know if we already had a, a DT set up for it and they were in our DT well, man we ran them like that or if they one time they set up on a hill across from us and they're firing mortars at us right. they're firing mortars at them right yeah we're trying to take out the anything mm -hmm. we're trying to take out anything that would you know not necessarily troops mm -hmm. because the big things the mortars and that would do more damage than just you know the troop right. because you know everybody's fighting with, with just rifles. And now would they move their mortars around? So they'd fire a couple of rounds from one spot and then move it oh, before yeah, you take get off them. Of them. Yeah. 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 But were they just trying to draw a bead on your mortar pits and take those out? They were just trying to do any kind of damage they could. Yeah. They were. I don't know. When generally, like at, at Birch's Garden, they came down the mountain and they zed the mortars down there. Mm -hmm. So they were they were planning on. You know, I don't think they were moving their mortar. Mm -hmm. You know, they were on another mountain. Watching and watching us, and they they came right down the mountain in, in a Z fashion like that, and that's basically you know the way our guns were set up was uh, we had a number one pit here and a, our two mm -hmm. pit which was George and I here, and then the other one was kind of right directly below it at the illumination pit. But they that's, I think that's what they're trying to do, you know, just blow anything that was there, you know, get anything out of there, whether it was a, a person or, or a gun or you know the mortar. Didn't, didn't make any difference. They were, that's what they were trying to cover as much as what they could in a particular way. I hear no telling the story about leaving. Okay. Well, I was asking, um, do you remember leaving the court or ending that campaign? Worst of my, worst day of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was terrible to leave those guys. I mean, I I felt bad. Did you go up by yourself, or did your whole squad go together? Or? No, it was just uh, Oscar Utley and I came in together. Mm -hmm. um, he was from Texas. He worked for Dr. Pepper down there. I love Dr. Pepper. He worked for Dr. Pepper, so we used to get a lot of care packages with mm -hmm. Dr. Pepper in it. But uh, him and I came in together the same day. He ended up being in FDC mm -hmm. with uh, with Pops. And uh, matter of fact, and I got a picture of him and I leaving my hooch, and of course we're getting, we're getting to bring a helicopter in is life threatening. I mean, they had so many of them shot down. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, this a bundle. Uh, what they did is they they would, the helicopters would come in and and just be a, a foot or so above the deck, and uh, they kick the ammunition out. If you need it, you know, when mm -hmm. you need ammunition, they kick ammunition, food or grenades, whatever mm -hmm. you have to have. So Oscar and I are standing in our, in my pit, and we got everything, we're ready to go. Uh, we have two days left in country. I mean, we're leaving on the 12th, and this is the 10th. So even though you were, had become a short timer, you're still out there in the field, okay? Normally short timers go in when they got 45 days yeah. left. 
and they, you know, you get a clerk's job or whatever. No, we were out there. We had two days left in country. I mean, now they're worried about getting us out of there because I don't know what they had, what comes up if you overextend somebody. I don't mm -hmm. know what happened, what the deal is. I know that, you know, your tour is 365 days and, you know, that's pretty much set in stone, it seemed like. So we had two days left in country. They were bringing in some ammunition, some supplies. So Oscar and I ran up to the, the helicopter and we dove over the ammunition as they were kicking it out. And got you know got on this Huey. The pilot looks at us and says, You can't you can't you can't go with this. You know, we're too heavy. We're too heavy. You can't go. And I put in my rifle that that way and I said I said, we know how to lighten it up. You know <laughs> he took off and we were too heavy. Man, we come down that mountain and the skids were in the treetops. The skids were in the treetops. We came down that mountain, and I mean, we came, we went treetop all the way back. Yeah, it was too heavy. How long was that before they shut down Ripcord? Do you know? Um, that was on that, that was on the tenth that, that I left. Um, by the time um, by the time I got home uh, on the twenty third, Ripcord had been overrun, and they took everybody off. They left everything behind. I got a letter from David that I'll show you. Um, it, David tells what they got out with. They got out with what they could carry, what mm -hmm. they had in their hands. Uh, a lot of guys didn't get their rucksacks out. They left it. They left all the all the uh, radar units, all the equipment, all the big guns, the mortars. Mm -hmm. um, then they brought in the biggest B-52 strike ever that the United States has ever done, and just blasted the top of the mountain away. There were six guys left behind. And they were killed. Um, they were hiding somewhere and didn't didn't get out. Um, then they went back in. The, I guess after they even after they, there were Vietnamese running all over the place mm -hmm. when they were blowing it up. And then even afterwards, when they went back into there, there were Vietnamese all over the place. But that was it. And I got home. Uh, flew into uh, to Washington, Fort Lewis. Was there 24 hours sitting in the airport trying to get a flight back to Lansing? Couldn't get one. Uh, we were flying military standby. There was a group of Girl Scouts that were flying just standby. But well, we bumped two of the Girl Scouts. Well, you've never been cussed out until you've been cussed out by a Girl Scout mother because she has to she either has to stay behind or with the, one of the girls or two of the girls or but they got bumped. She, they were our irate. I said, you know, I've been gone a year. I'm gonna. We got into Detroit like at two in the morning. I think it was. Um, it was foggy. It was so foggy you couldn't see across the street. Um, no planes were flying. You could have, you could have thrown a bowling ball down the airport. I mean, there was nobody in the airport at about two o'clock in the morning. I mean, this is way back. I mean, there's just nothing, nobody. And we got a cab ride home. The, there were four of us coming back to Lansing. We we got a cab and each pitched in for the cab. All right. This tape is about done here. All right, so we had basically gotten you out of Vietnam, uh, back to Detroit in, in the fog, in, 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 so, and, and took a cab from Detroit yeah, we, to Lansing? There was nothing flying, and we, we were in Detroit at the airport. Um, we'd been gone a year. We didn't care how we got We At that point, we probably would have walked. So we all got together, pooled our money, what we had, and found a cabbie and told him, well, how much it take to get us back to Lansing? Mm -hmm. And he told us, and then we all piled in his cab. And I mean, you couldn't see the car in front of you. And he's trying to go down the highway, like, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour, because he wants to make his money, get to Lansing and get back. Mm -hmm. And we told him, hey, we just all came back to Vietnam. You take your time. You know, we all had our heads stuck out the window, you know, feeling for curbs, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, when, I'm, it's just amazing we didn't have somebody sitting out on the front bumper watching for the car in front, you know. But uh, it, you couldn't see anything. It took us, it took us, uh, we didn't get back in town, in here until like, like uh, five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the guys lived out on Kavanaugh, so 
one of the, I can't remember, we, we dropped him off as we came in, and I was, Craig was, lived out on camp, his, his uh, mother-in-law lived there, still does, and uh, so I got out when he got out, and took my duffel bag, and I lived over here next to Ingham, and uh, started walking home at that point. And got home, and it's still, you know, it's probably, you know, quarter to six or something in the morning, and got home, went up on the front porch, and the newspaper guy delivering the newspaper, so... I'm sitting out in front reading the newspaper and it was my uh, in-law's house and uh, my father-in-law came out the front door to get the paper and with a cup of coffee in his hand just <laughs> lost his cup of coffee and spilled it. I was sitting out there reading the paper and that, that was coming home and uh, lived in, you know, went over to visit my folks and Greg was, got back about the same time. He was the one that we went through basic equipment, you know, while well, we rode home and uh, met up again. Had, you know, everybody got together and we had a little cookout and cake and uh, used to hang around with Greg quite a bit. And then uh, we both got divorced and he went his way. I haven't talked to him in quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to George. I had, I went over to my mother's house. She called me one day and she said, I got a letter here from a board wine. I said, oh, Amy board wine. I, I never put two and two together. I didn't have any idea. Okay. Well, when I was in Vietnam, George Boardwine, mm -hmm. I had him, he didn't have a girlfriend, so I had, he was the same age as my sister. So I had him send to my sister Joy letters. They were mm -hmm. writing back and forth. Well, Amy, his daughter now, um, was going through his, some of his stuff and found the address and wrote a letter to me, mm -hmm. which was my old address. That's where I live. And, uh, my sister Lou, and said, if, "Would I mind, you know, if uh, George called me, or, and she, or would I call him, and mm -hmm. she'd pay for the, the call, if it was, you know, just call collectors, mm -hmm. write a letter, or whatever." And so, um, I finally, about a month later, called him. It took a lot to, to what do you say mm -hmm. to somebody? You know, this is 30 years later. Yeah. And uh, we talked for a little bit, but we really had nothing in common, and. I haven't talked to him since, so now it's been another 40, another, you know, 15 years. And I did, I was at a reunion and happened to see a guy at a reunion and said, well, you were at Ripcord, weren't you? And I said, yeah, and he had a Ripcord newsletter, mm -hmm. one of the first ones. And Pops's name, John Hendrick, was in there. Mm -hmm. I said, I know Pops. And I thought you might. And so I got his name and address from that, and uh, I called him. Mm -hmm. I called him. And... Uh, um, lay up in bed talking to him on the phone and you know Pops can tell you from the very minute anything that we did or anything that went on he was right in with all with with Andre, Andre Lucas mm -hmm. our, our battalion commander and all the higher ups he was in he was right close with them uh, there's a, an article that was in Stars and Stripes on, that I've got a, that, on the trailer that where Andre Lucas, our battalion commander, was sitting in Pops's chair, which was made out of some ammo boxes, and Pops was giving him a haircut. Pops gave everybody haircuts, <laughs> and Andre Lucas says, "Where else can you get a haircut and watch a fire or a air strike at the same time?" And he's sitting out there ripcord during a, a bombing run, you know. And Andre was killed on top of my hooch. Mm -hmm. His top, of course, is right behind the chopper pad, and him and his XO were killed on. On top of my hooch. He was a he was a great guy. Um, from even you know from talking to pops and not I didn't know him Andrew personally, but um, just from in passing and the fact that he was you know his place is on top of my place, uh, being tenants in the same mountain. Uh, he was just he was a soldier soldier. Mm -hmm. I mean he looked out for his guys. He he uh, he took care of us really well. And you know when we needed something, he was there for us. And, and you don't get that from a lot of them. Like I say, some of them, you know, from above him, you know, we got clean clothes and ice cream from our from our company commander. That, but if you had a body count, other than that, forget you. You know, you can do without food and water for um, three or four days at least. And we we did that. We had that happen where they wouldn't resupply us and. You had to eat what you know, whatever you could find. 
uh, when you got um, when you got back home, I mean, did you talk to people much about what you had seen or done in Vietnam, or did you just kind of put that in a box someplace? Um, and... I went to I went to a, a couple parties with some friends that um, were neighbors. Um, we had partied, you know, a lot of times before I went. I mean, as young when we were younger and stuff, and we used to go, you know, have all, we'd always have all these parties, and um, I went to those, and nobody wanted nobody def, nobody wanted to hear about it to mm -hmm. begin with, and a lot of them they I had a, there was a gal from Ann Arbor that her and her husband came in parties, and she called us baby killers and. So, I mean, it may sound strange, and yeah, I know you hear it, and you may think, you know, this is just another Vietnam vet saying this BS, and I hate it when people say it, that they called us that. She called me that. She, we Rick and I were together at the party at, at, at uh, Mike's house, and, you know, she was uh, from Ann Arbor. She was mm -hmm. a student, you know, UVM. And after that, um, we never... We never hung out with the group yet, mm -hmm. after that. Um, my uh, kids all went through the Everett High School where I went, and Nick played baseball. He was a, oh, he was a bat boy for Raymonds. was a, just a triple-A kind of mm -hmm. ball team here in town, or ABC or whatever they call it. And, uh, so we'd go out to the municipal, to the ballpark, and uh, the families would be there. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are older than me. And Nick was, you know, just a little guy. He's probably only six, seven, eight years old. He was a bat boy. He was just a kind of, you know, their little mascot mm -hmm. kind of thing. He loved ball, loved baseball. So I got him in with Raymond. I knew Rich and Rich, you know, they played all over. We went to Battle Creek. We'd go all over and play ball. And, and uh, I could go to the ballpark and wear my jungle fatigue shirt, mm -hmm. and nobody would sit anywhere near me. I'd have the bleachers to myself. And I mean, so you know, there is a real stigma that goes mm -hmm. with it. Um, the first psychiatrist I went to see when I, was, I had a bad time with my heart and and uh, blood pressure, and I went started in with the VA, seeing mm -hmm. seeing uh, getting medic medicine and, and stuff, and seeing a psychiatrist. And my first psych told me, well, uh, you shouldn't wear green and you shouldn't watch war movies. And I'm thinking. You know, this is this is just like you know, six eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, and for for the forty or thirty years before that, I've been ever since I got back. A friend of mine was in. He didn't make the military because he's four F. He had a hunchback, mm -hmm. and so he was collected. He collects from Civil War on up military things, mm -hmm. and he's got all sort, just tons of it, a huge barns full of it. And so he would take me to these gun and knife shows because he wanted me to authenticate what he was buying for his Vietnam collection. Mm -hmm. So you know. It's not that the Vietnam, th I would buy a few things, you know, we were raising kids, I didn't have a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, three or four bucks I'd spend, I'd find a dummy grenade or, a, you know, a patch or something like that. That's what started out the collection. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of got out of hand, but um, we would do air shows. He got me, he had, a, he had a, a deuce and a half in the trailers and everything, and he got me taking my collection. I was helping him, basically. Mm -hmm. I went along to help him. And then he said, well, why don't you bring some of your stuff? Well, we'd unload one of the trailers, and I'd put a, a poncho liner down, or uh, a raincoat, or you know something like that, and I'd put some of my pictures down there. Mm -hmm. Well, when you went to the military side, all of a sudden, all the military people were, and the people who were coming to see the military were coming and looking at my stuff, and I thought, wow, that's you know, I didn't think a lot of it, but I thought that's really nice. You know, they were interested in my things, you know. And ever since I got back and he got me going, I was always been looking for something. And I, and I never, I, I don't know if it was a person, um, somebody to say something particular or a piece of equipment. I, I never, ever since I got back, I've, I've had this problem. I've been, I've been hunting, hunting, hunting for this thing. And that's how, you know, I kept buying all this stuff, thinking that if I go to these shows, I'll run into the guys, you know, and I'd run into guys, that, military guys, all the time. I mean, just tons of them for 30 years. And, and I could never find that answer, you know. But that's how everything started. And then um, my second 
the VA psychologist that I ended up with, the second one, um, her and I got to talking and I kept telling her I'm hunting for, you know, I don't know what I'm hunting for. I, I could never figure out what I was hunting for. What, what's this thing that, it's eating me up and it has for 40 years. And I can't, you know, I can't get peace. I have not, you know, I have not found that, that thing to finish, to, to draw the line and say this is, this is the, it's ended, it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking for this thing that finishes it. It's like, you know, the book and somebody ripped out the last page or the chapter. You, you, where, what is it? What, how did that, how does it work? What does it end? And I got to talk with her and uh, I didn't like talking to her at the beginning because she was young. Mm -hmm. She's really, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going through all this heart stuff, all these problems. Uh, PTSD's got me, you know, my wife and I are, you know, I mean, I'm trying to kill myself. I mean, yeah, I'm, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm leaving the house here and walking down through the worst part of town carrying a, a knife, you know, just looking for somebody to fight with. And I mean, I, I would drink, you know, I drank a lot, and then I was funny when I first started drinking. Well, then it just went the opposite way, and I, I would drink and get really, not drunk, but really s drunk, mm -hmm. but, you know, you know, trying to find this peace and whatever I'm looking for. And I, then I, I, I got ugly, and all I wanted to do was fight. So then, you know, I had to stop doing that because Jennifer wouldn't leave when she was with me. Mm -hmm. I'd toss her the keys and say, here, go home, I'll be home in a little bit. And then I'd go on with my business, you know, the, getting into a fight. And at one point in time, she says, no, I'm not leaving. And at that point, I said, you know, it clicked in my head that something's got to change. Mm -hmm. I can't do this anymore. Because now I'm endangering her life, and that's what I'm, you know, and that's all my life I've been trying to protect people. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just carries through. It, it never leaves you from that. It's drilled into your head back then when you're 19. It never leaves you. And so, you know, now I'm back at the same thing. So mm -hmm. I had, I had quit drinking and started going, you know, PTSD groups, seeing a psychiatrist. I see one a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, Angela was with, with the one, and I told her, I don't have time to educate her, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I told her at the beginning when he first, I said, you know, people that deal with Vietnam veterans usually die. I said, it's not, you know, you should really find some other line to get away from veterans that, you know, it's not healthy. It's not, my, when I came back, my doctor, who was my age, died, you know. Um, the next one, I, the next person I got in touch with, he died, um, not knowing I'm talking with Angela, and she's getting me through this thing. She has cancer, and she dies. And this was like just a few years ago. And I was really, she found my answer, and I lost her. And it, so now I'm starting in with, the, you know, I've got Bill, a new guy that, that's taking over our group. But if it wasn't for the group, you know, I'd been back out there on the street, you know, walking with my knife again. But, uh, and you wouldn't be at a place where you can talk to me. Yeah, and and any the others. I mean, you know, that's what I think. That's what that's what holds me to my firm space. Is that I think you know, all these guys that went through this and didn't come back. Mm -hmm. That's what my trailer's about, mm -hmm. and that's what Angela told me. She said she said, you know, the trailer doesn't mean any difference for your PTSD. That's not the cause of your PTSD. Mm -hmm. That's not bringing on your PTSD. You could get rid of all the green in the world, and it wouldn't stop your PTSD. Mm -hmm. That's not the problem. The problem you have is in your head. And I, we started talking. I said, you know, I know when I was in one of the fire trucks, I said, everybody around us, you know, around me is getting shot. You know, people are dying and stuff. And, you know, I said, I told her, I said, you know, I've talked a lot to God. I said, I really feel bad because, you know, a hard, I don't dare step into a church because, you know, I made God a lot of promises that, I knew I couldn't keep, and I said, I think he knew I couldn't keep them too, you know, that I made, you know, these people are, you know, God, get my guys out of this, get me out of this, you know, uh, let us, you know, give us another day, and, you, know, you know, give us something, you know, and somehow, you know, help us through this, you know, and it's just, and that we were, you know, she was, we were talking about the trailer and that, and she said, you know, she said, well, that's, that's what you're looking for. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, 
this is your promise to God in the trailer. That you're keeping all these guys alive. Mm -hmm. You're keeping them well. You're keeping them remembered. And that's what you promised God. And now this is your payment. This is what you, how you're repaying him. Mm -hmm. Is by doing this. That's why the trailer has nothing to do. You won't get better getting rid of all this and staying away from it. It'll have nothing to do with it. You, you can meet all the veterans you want. You can wear all the green you want. That's not... This is your promise to God, and that's what you're in your, your brain, and that's what's, what, it's, what you're looking for. And I finally found my peace. Thank you. Makes for a pretty good place for us to close this out, so I'd just like to uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to me here today. I'm glad, I'm glad we had this time. I've never done it before, so. All right. Okay. Especially not in this depth.